you ready? Yep. Okay, call the meeting to order. Are there any uh, changes or adjustments to the agenda as presented? I do have three changes. Okay. Um, we had made a commitment to hear and discuss a proposal for a finance committee. Yep. Uh, and we've also received a petition to form a collective bargaining unit that we need to discuss. And we also have uh, communications from our attorney uh, to discuss also. Okay. So that's two separate? Yeah. Okay. I guess three altogether counting the finance committee. Okay. Um, and I believe the finance committee, we would slip in underneath the uh, item two. Uh, either after item two or item three, uh, Duncan okay. had made the proposal those. and uh, okay. while he's here to talk about the items from the historical society, seems a good time to talk about the finance committee too. Okay. Anybody got anything else? I'd like an update on our racial justice workshop, if there is one. Okay. Anyone else? None. Is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for December 2nd? Two meetings on the Was that, yeah, the joint and the uh, regular? I would uh, move to cancel. Accept the vote. Do we have a second? Lacking a second, motion will die. We do actually don't have both of them in front of us. You had them emailed to you. I understand that, but I. I didn't print it because I was a little bit low on it. Okay. Did I only give you one set? Like yeah, I just got the December 2nd. Uh, which December 2nd did you get? The joint or the working? Uh, it looks like I gave you just the regular set. Yeah, the regular set. I left off the joint. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Oh, can I have two sets of those? Maybe one of these is for you. With both of them? Your motion is to approve both as printed? That's the motion. Yep. yep. Do we have a second? Second. Got a second. Any more discussion? I'm going to recuse myself. I wasn't at this meeting. Okay. So noted. Carl's recused yourself. Okay, Any second. other discussion? A second, Mr. Chairman. There was one thing I wanted to make a clarification on. I thought I was going to get it. Probably in a whole scheme of things, it's not going to amount to a hill of beans. When they're dead and gone, they don't make a bit of difference. I suppose if it, uh, it if it's that big of a deal to me that I could make an addendum at a later time. Yes. So I'm sure you'll have the votes to approve them, and I'll just abstain. Anything else? Anyone else? Seeing none, all those in favor, seeing five saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstain. And two abstentions and the chair votes in favor. Uh, Rosemary, is that four? Anything give you alarm? Not yet. Okay. The state has finally got caught up on their um, 
book assignment program. Um, they just sent us June through November. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, they, this is not the big one. We need to get one senior. This is the each one they send us little ones. Okay. Perfect. How much was it? Estimated, which is good news because that's been below estimated for the last couple of years. Probably some of it's a timing. You mean this, that's a stone? Are you looking at stone over there? I was looking at revenue from law enforcement. Okay. We've received $5,200 and we estimated $5,000. Yeah, we remember to get the big one. He's yeah. Like, it's a small, I don't know, little one. I'm just remarking that the last several years it's been below our estimate, so mm -hmm. this is a nice change. Great direction. And there are pilot money and current use money. <coughs> and there are money. Center are having three receptions in the coming year. One for January 5th. These are all the Red Mill um, Gallery. And one for January 29th. And one for January 2nd. Just need our approval? Yep, they're all between 5 30 and 6 p.m. Well, it's board's pleasure. Approve, approve the conditions. Got a motion to approve. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? 
Um, Gary Smith, the owner of uh, 399 Lower Main West for the Firewoods on November 1st, has requested a tax abatement. Would you like to set a hearing? Okay. Uh, I'll be into December or January sometime. Do you want that tonight or you want to we can sit down at some point and figure it out? <coughs> okay. And um, our tech group is our computer support people, and they have given us a estimate of about $9,700 to replace all the computers they feel need replacing. And a lot of it will be between the town and the village for the people and the office. And it's Brian's computer laptop replacement. Not really. So probably the town chair will be about five thousand dollars. Place five or six months. That comes out of our line item yes. for a small. Yeah. The trustees have already given it to us. Okay. What's the board's pleasure? Want to so approve the remaining balance? Can you approve? Yeah. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any more discussion? I just remember November 1st, during the flooding, trying to use the office computers, and they were so slow. So slow. So this is, uh, this is due. Can we, um, can we get Brian's replace sooner? It sounds like that's urgent. It would certainly be helpful. Now, what's a turnaround on this? Okay. Anything else? I'd like to see the uh, delinquent taxes posted on our website. Uh, first on the motion, though. Oh. Any, any other thing? Oh, okay. I mean, you said anything else? Well, I'll sure. get back to you then. <laughs> right. See no more discussion. All those in favor, signify saying aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? And then I think Mike has some. Okay. Um, holiday pay. Do you want to keep the usual $100 to the employees? Yes. So will we? Do you need a motion? Uh, I would have so moved. Do you have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, same five saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That's all you got, Mike. You had something? No, I just figured that it wouldn't hurt to post the uh, the taxes on the town website. It's all on digits anyway. You could just fire it over to it, couldn't you? <laughs> and what's your why? No, it's just uh, it's all a part of everything. It's public knowledge. It wouldn't hurt for people to to see what's going on in our community. Yeah. You're saying on the web page? Yeah, it's public knowledge. It's posted on the uh, town report every year. Would it be that hard to keep it updated? Once a month? I don't think that's necessary. I mean, there are a lot of things that are public knowledge that people can come in and get records for and see what we're mm -hmm. collecting and spending. I think there are enough teeth in our collection laws that we don't need to shame people. Yeah, this feels more like public shaming than anything. Well, it's no different than having your name in the town report either. It's Same quite, a, quite a bit different, in my opinion. Well, that's what the deal is. We've all got different opinions. So the opinion is that we're not going to do it. So we'll move on. Sort of the consensus I'm hearing. Um, how are you doing on the uh, replacement for GM? Okay. Several good applications. Good. You still want some involvement from the select board and trustees? Anything else? Anybody got anything else for? <coughs> if not, then Brian, you get the floor. 
There's not too many things on the report to talk about. One is we did take delivery on our new truck. So that's coming along nice. We're working the kinks out of that. And then another thing is I wanted to give you a heads up on overtime being that winter started, you know, beginning of November again. The FEMA covers all the overtime that we had during our flooding event that we won't be doing too bad. But we have been racking up the hours with the rain, the freezing rain and the mm -hmm. snow that we have. So I just wanted to let you know that we're, I'm, I'm doing everything I can to keep it down. Weekends we're running three guys, you know, so a couple of guys have off and they're not racking up all the overtime. Okay. Is that it? That's all I needed to talk about, yes. Um, anybody got anything for Brian? Um, General, I have a question about um, where we stand with that FEMA issue. Um, do we have a total dollar damage to our roads? Have we, we, how's the paperwork going with that? Right now we are, we submitted our damage reports. I don't have the dollar figure off the top of my head, but we submitted our preliminary reports and we are, there's going to be a hearing that they hold. Uh, they'll hold a couple of them around the state and we have to present in person again that we have, that we're making the request and filing it officially. Wow. Um, and I don't have a date for that yet. And I sent an email out that came in late this afternoon to the full board uh, from Mount Emergency Management. They anticipate the governor will be declaring or asking for a federal declaration by the end of this week. And, and that, that's the delay that we're facing yes. for holding the hearing also is that the request for the declaration was delayed. I, I don't exactly okay. understand why. And then it's up to, I think they set up the possible another month before it gets approval from the president and comes back down through. Anything else? I have a question. Um, Brian, I'm sure you've told us, me, this before, but can you just quickly describe how um, how you decide when to send the guys out for when it's bad weather, and you, like how you make that call? If it's a day that, like a weekend and it's going to be snowing out, I'll mm -hmm. drive around. And usually if I can get around in two-wheel drive in the pickup, I figure everybody else can get around. Mm -hmm. and I try to keep, I try to keep those weekend calls to a minimum mm -hmm. because all that's overtime. And if I can get around and pick up and make it up and down the hills, I figure everybody else can. Thank you. I did want to thank you guys for cleaning up that tree in the cemetery that came down from the storm. Oh, you're welcome. Anything else? If not, move on. You need me to stick around. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm going to need you for something else a little bit later if you can hang around. Okay. Planning Commission, Duncan, are you here to provide that as well? Or, oh, or will, Kim is, sorry. Yeah, I guess I Kim is for the local. Uh, I have. Dave Butler is usually around, but I don't see him. So I'll just let you know that we wrapped up the class four road discussion policies. It's all being collated by, thank you, Paul Borden. And um, I think the next meeting, it will get motioned upward and it will be passed on to the select board for a year review. Good. It's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> we are very, very happy to have a few people from the public who live on class four roads come in. Mm -hmm. With one particular person who was extremely helpful. So that was really nice to have that input. Perfect. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, I do have a bit of news from Dave Butler. I was able to talk to him okay. today. Uh, okay. David is going to, he'd like to stay on the planning commission, but he's uh, would, like, would like to step back as the chair. Uh, That's, we don't appoint though. We don't. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, kind of rotate around and we're trying to find someone who would be interested in doing it. Okay. Yeah. 
perfect. So he'll act as chair until a replacement is found. Yes, that that's a plan. It is, you know, that he'll act as chair at least for the one more meeting because a new chair hasn't been appointed yet. So he'll convene at the very least the next meeting, and hopefully the board will make a decision about a new chair at that point. Good. Mm -hmm. right. Duncan, I believe you had an update about LCPC. Oh, LCPC? Yes. Um, so you guys all should have a copy of the letter from uh, Tosh Laws at LCPC mm -hmm. regarding the annual request to be included in the town of Washington. There's not an increase uh, from last year, so hopefully it's going to be a typical annual appropriation. Um, as a board, we've been working on Various items, including bylaw changes, um, code of conduct, uh, uh, trying to get an adoption of code of conduct. LCPC has a uh, totally clean um, audit, which was done by Sullivan County. Um, very, very good audit report. In general, I think the, the board is uh, a really good working board. Got some good dedicated people, and I think you have know, got a really good staff right now. They're doing quite a few things for Jonathan, um, which you have copies, you know, copies of the, the annual report. What's, what's been going on? If anybody has any questions, certainly I can answer any of those. Good. We have that really interesting um, little issue or problem. Uh, it, it came to light a couple of years ago that. LCPC actually owned a little island in the middle of um, uh, Kenfield Brook in Morristown. Um, nobody really knew about it until the Morristown listers sent a uh, tax bill. Um, <laughs> so uh, we were able to successfully make an appeal before the Morristown Board of Abatement and get the taxes abated for a two year period. Um, and now we're trying to work on a proposal to transfer the piece of property to the, some sort of public entity uh, because that was how the LCPC got it. It was intended to be access <coughs> for the public. So if anybody wants to live in the middle of Kenfield Brook and wants to make it totally available for the public at any point in time, <laughs> we're looking for takers. Doesn't it have the island and some shoreland? On there, the is, there is some adjacent shoreland. Yeah, there's a roughly, roughly an acre. Including, including the island. The, one of the main issues is um, there is a, a very old deeded right of way, but it does not appear that that right of way was carried on in subsequent um, deeds for the adjoining property, which is the subject of the easement. So that's probably somewhat problematic. <laughs> You can't think these things up. <laughs> but we got our own island. That's why I mentioned it. Yep. I think I was as five, three, three, three acres. Three point three. Okay. Um, I guess that's all from LCPC and local. Unless anybody has any questions. Yeah. Uh, library. Who's giving a report? Um, I don't see Jessica or Jasmine here, so I will tell you what I know. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your support um, that you showed us at the last meeting, um, helping us with the planning <coughs> issues. Um, Jean got a couple of estimates for the cost of the decades. Um, one was about $4,000. A second one was eight to two hundred. Um, the four thousand dollar one need um, had additional money for shipping, so actually the two estimates came very close um, to about the five thousand dollar mark. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, there's going to have to be some cement poured underneath where the floodgate is installed so that it can seal. Um, so there's going to be a little bit of labor cost involved with that. Um, so we thought um, asking for 
$5,500 for a floodgate would be a reasonable request. Um, the bottom of the windows um, are about two and a half feet off the ground. So anytime the water gets above that, um, flood water is going to come in the windows. So we got an additional estimate for the windows, and um, that was $3,500 to replace the windows. So the total of that is about $9,000. Um, so that's my report. <laughs> Tell us about the windows. Are they they uh, they help with the flooding, or they they're sealed all the way sealed. around, and they don't open. Um, it, it, supposedly, they will keep water out. The new ones. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Even the pressure. They're, they're flood windows. I don't, I don't know a lot about that. Um, Jasmine knows more. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Jasmine is going to be here uh, a little bit later today. Okay. Okay. <coughs> That's my report. That's all. Okay. I know. Great. Well, thank you. That's good information. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yes. are we going to discuss that more when Jasmine comes? Probably when she comes. Okay. Yeah, she'll she'll come sure. back to it. <laughs> Want to start into your report? Sure. Actually, you want me to take the first item? That's the one I talked to Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I, I talked to Mark Nielsen about they're looking for a uh, an outreach method uh, mechanism for the school board. They don't seem to have a lot of participation at their school board meetings. Um, they're looking at us as having a little bit more participation than they have. And an idea that Mark and I threw around and came up with is basically along the lines of giving them, you know, the, the four or five minute report out like planning commission or, or, or a library does here. And then if there's anybody here that wants to talk with the school board more about their issues, they could break out and go to the other meeting room and, and discuss the school issues and we continue on with our business. But it, it would be, uh, I mean, they don't report to us. Really, we don't have any authority or anything to do with them, but it gives them an opportunity to at least tell us what they're doing, anything that's happening. And then if anybody's from the public or even board members want to discuss certain issues with them, they'll break off and go into a you know, like the other second meeting room. And, and even if all five uh, school board members were here, it's still not a quorum of their board, so they don't have to worry about that kind of issue. But as a, a way of them getting a little commu communication method. So it was a thought. What boards, we would have to take a little time out of our agenda to provide for them. But. Try it. Try it. Okay. Yep. I just I wanted to um, say I thought it was really informative to hear what was going on, and I didn't have a clue, and I don't have kids and the whole bus snafu, but I really felt that it was really important to, as a community, to support the people that weren't getting those services, and so as a community member, I would appreciate having more input from that source. I think it's a very good idea. So many people have no clue about what's happening in the school system. And communication is tough because there's so many towns. So I think it would really start to raise awareness, especially if budgets are coming up. Well, I haven't heard one voice against it, so I guess I'll get a hold of Mark and make the offer to him if they want somebody from the school, whether it's administration or board members at least be here to do a, a very short report out and then be available for any discussions with public. So that'd be at one or both of our meetings a month? Uh, I, I'll ask. I was assuming it would only be the one meeting a month. but Okay. That, It'd be important to make own... that clear to the public so they come to the 
yeah. right meeting <laughs> with him <laughs> if they're coming for that. It'd probably be our regular meeting like okay. this, this yeah. one, where we have the planning commission. Yeah. Everybody. Okay. But I'll I'll get with Mark and, and get that worked out. Okay. But it really wouldn't be part of your meeting, right? No, it'd be nothing more than a report out. An opportunity for them to report out. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you're taking the lead or Duncan on this. Well, I'm going to ask for uh, a little bit of help from Duncan, but we'll start out with the, the historical society is ready to select a strategic planning consultant. Uh, if you recall, we approved for them to go out for a grant for kind of uh, healthy long-term planning for the historical society. Uh, they've received the grant and they've started applying out for, uh, you know, bringing in some consultants to help come up with their plan. Uh, they've got uh, one in particular that they would like to use. Uh, Noon Mark was the one that came in, but Duncan, I'll ask for your help on. Uh, why yeah, this? We we, um, we solicited uh, or circulated a request for a proposal. We got four uh, four total proposals. They ranged in price from about thirty five fifty five to about sixty four hundred. We had a, have a grant for twenty five hundred dollars from the Vermont Community Foundation. I think I sent all this out to you guys in in, a, in an email, but for, for the for the record. Um, and then we had requested uh, approximately $2,500 be held back of our surplus of last year, which the board approved. So we basically have um, $5,000 available to do the study. Uh, the Historical Society did a really good job of reviewing all the applications. Lois can speak to it um, as well. Um, we, you know, we went through a formalized process and the, the unanimous vote of the Historical Society was to select Noonmark Associates. Um, they also happen to be the lowest cost proposal at thirty-five fifty-five. but I, I think it's fair to say that that was not the um, major reason for us to pick them. We also felt they had the, the best overall grasp of what the Historical Society is looking for in developing a strategic plan. Um, so our ask of you tonight is to authorize the selection of uh, Noonmark Associates, and we're also hoping that you will authorize, ideally, the chairman of the Historical Society Board to execute the contracts and um, sign any necessary papers. So that's the ask. It's a board's pleasure. This would have to be a formal motion. Yeah, I'm good with it. I just, uh, just the request for the share of the Historical Society to sign the papers is that that's a little different than what we usually do, isn't it? It's a little bit different. There's but no concern about that. No. So I'll make the motion that we approve the uh, bid from Newmark Associates from 3555 for Historical Society uh, plan authorizing their chair. Author authorizing their chair to sign it. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Got a motion to second. Any more discussion? When do you think this would start, Duncan? Um, actually, all of the uh, proposals said they could start in January. We would love to start the process in January. Um, we have a deadline of August 15th, I believe, for the uh, submission of the final report to uh, Vermont Community Foundation. There's only one report required um, for this. And I am assuming that since you guys authorized me to file the paperwork, that the authorization would extend to filing the final grant report as well. But we can cover that later if we need to. Okay. Kim, you got something? Yeah, just a clarification. A, a long time ago, when the Holcomb House was purchased by the Historical Society, I thought that the, that the town and, 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 well, everyone concerned it was a a historical society owned thing. So I'm just trying to understand why they come to you to get okays for anything. As of right now, the historical society end of 
recently they voted to stay under the town's umbrella. They are a entity of the town. Can I add to that? Sure. So, so they're, they're really, um, there's the Johnson Historical Society, which is a town entity. We have insurance through the town. The town owns the building. Um, but there is also a 501c3, the Johnson Historical Society, Inc., which is the fundraising entity and the express purpose of the 501c3 is to support the activities of the Johnson Historical Society. So that's there. There are two different entities, and it can be somewhat confusing, but mm. Johnson Historical Society, which I'm a board member and Lois is a board member, um, is a town sponsored entity with appointments made by the town. Maybe I can add something. The at the meeting where we voted to to buy the Holcomb House, the presentation was that the historical society would raise as much money as they could uh, and use it for the purchase. But the property was going to be owned by the town, and we and the town extended its credit for purposes of procuring it. But so the town owns the building. Yeah. And took out the loan. And took out the loan, etc. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. So why don't we loop back to Jasmine Neal? We got a okay. brief report from the library that with some numbers on floodgates, uh, ceiling windows, but you had all the. Uh, yes, I have, um, I have one copy here. That's okay. Do you, do you want it? Uh, I can pass it down. Yeah. Or even unless you need it just to oh, wait. read it for. Uh, no, I've got another copy. Okay. Um, so we got three different quotes. We're deciding to go with the same company that Sterling or the Parmelo uh, building uses um, with install and um, freight and labor it the total cost of the um, floodgates would be around $5,500 um, and they would be six feet high and I don't know what other information you want but that's the quote for the so and the work would not be able to be done until springtime because you've got to put the cement pad in cement pad yep and your thoughts are not to go forward at this time to the windows? Say it again. What about the windows? The windows are part of that, because we were asking the select board for 9,500. Mm -hmm. um, 5,500 would be for the floodgates. Four grand would be for the four windows oh, okay. that need replacing. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the windows, how they work? Because I understand yeah. they're watertight, but they'll, they'll Take the pressure from the water rising. Yep. So right now, their your average window we had them yeah. reseal. We're going to be putting in aquatic grade windows that do not open. Huh? Um, Kristen, right now, when she runs programs down in the basement, never opens the windows because if they're having it inside, it's typically winter. If it's summer, they're outside. So there would be no need to open up the windows anyways. Um, so they would be that much more efficient, that much tighter, um, and they could be ordered to specific size. Um, and there's variations within that. We got a very rough estimate for the windows. And I think that the um, the window that they, the window that they said the um, install and purchase for each window would be roughly a thousand dollars a piece depending on what grade we went on. Um, we're asking for four grand with the understanding that if it came to be about five grand, we have a little bit of wiggle room in our budget for that. I guess what I'm asking about the windows is yeah. if there's a foot of water outside covering the windows, it's gonna hold. If there's two feet yes. of water, it's gonna hold. Yes, yes, okay. yep. Wow. And so your your request from the select board tonight is for how much? 
is for $9,500. $9,500, okay. Mm-hmm. How much is our emergency management? How much we get it? It's going to come out of that fund. That's what I thought it would be. More than that. We get plenty. Did we stop it back? Send it back, right? Okay. So we do have the funds available if the select board um, sees fit from our emergency management fund. Go. Uh, a question and <coughs> perhaps an observation, maybe, hopefully, somebody's thought about this. You, you refer to a six foot height. Mm-hmm. Um, you're talking about pressure. Um, it's, I, I know from experience when we looked at the wastewater treatment facility, the floodgate doors there are sized at height that engineers decided would not if the floodwaters rose to that level it wouldn't collapse the walls um so my question is you're talking about six feet Mm -hmm. that's pretty high um did they do any analysis as to whether or not the foundation wall will withstand six feet of water um the foundation wall has withstood six feet of water in 1995, was it? Well, you had water inside. Yeah, yeah, right. So this is water, this is water inside out. and outside. Right. This is still water outside, outside, which is yeah very much different than yeah. water inside. It's a, um, it's a good point. Um, something to be considered, but I would say without knowing the answer to your question that airing on the side of covering our bases based on the history and also the um, the frequency rising uh, with how many storms that we're getting, erring on the side of caution and covering our bases um, to cover the majority of the door frame would be in our favor. As long um, as it doesn't blow the foundation in and destroy the, the entire library. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's the concern. It's yeah. Whether hydraulically six feet is the right. Height. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, you know, when we were doing the research, it stated that the runners need to be mounted to concrete. Um, but I, yeah, I don't know the answer to that. It might be worth looking at. Probably we should have a structural engineer look at that building. Look at that building. Before we put this money into, I mean that's a th- it's a thick wall and it probably will probably will will withstand it. But I would hate to see a six foot gate put in and have six feet of water, which <coughs> blew in the foundation, and did a yeah. whole lot more damage than the possible water damage. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I we. I guess, um, from my standpoint, we would like to purchase floodgates. We know that. Mm-hmm. Um, could the board still approve of us purchasing floodgates with the contingency that you would approve the floodgates that we purchase after checking in with someone to um, assess where we're at? Did that make any sense what I just yes, said? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> yeah. My sense of, of the board is that we would certainly be willing to approve, and I would say at some point, but I, I'm concerned about the uh, um, having a structural engineer look at it. When I really believe that you need to look at the whole the whole building. You need to find out are there any other impervious. Will your you know this is brick. You know it'll hold. Uh, you ju- you just want to know that you're building right for what you have because you can you can cause more harm than good. But we certainly want to have floodgates that protect that building as much as possible. We saw the total benefit of that the last uh, storm, the Halloween storm that we had with with the Sterling March. You know. And we want it, you know, I'm totally in favor of protecting it, but I think that the, the thing missing is someone looking at this, you know, I think it's an essential cost to have an engineer look at this and say what is the appropriate level to, to uh, that these things should be. Can you, Brian, could you help with the library? Yeah, I'll, I'll work it. 
Do you want to get in as an engineer and to uh, study that? Okay. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, it's a very good point. It's not an enormously complex. I mean, the, you know, the pressure, <clears throat> pounds per square foot of pressure of rising water is a known thing, so. Yeah, it's not hard to do the calculation. It's not, it's I just not hard know. to do the calculation. You just, just want to make sure that it's going to stand up. Yeah, I don't know how to evaluate the wall. I, I can figure out the amount of pressure it exerts. Well, but. I think that's where you need the certification of an instructional engineer. Yeah. <clears throat> didn't when Pomerlo did the building, didn't they put, uh, you know, they dealt with their, <clears throat> the entrances, you know, they they put uh, things to stop water coming in from their plumbing and in their other uh, electrical. They, they covered up all the holes, basically, so it wasn't, you know, coming up from the bottom. They did do that as part of the as part of the funding for the you know the, the grant that the town secured. Part of that was um, securing all of the electrical connections and the plumbing connections, storm drains, etc. So that when they did put the uh, the uh, floodgates in, they weren't getting infiltration from other sources. Yeah. And it seems like when they put the floodgates in, that was. One reason that the question was, how come you didn't put them five feet high and that would have prevented the 95 flood from going in? And it was because of that wall, the structural walls could not take that amount of outside pressure. That's also pretty close to the height of the existing window. Right. So, I mean, they could have technically built higher, but they would have had to replace the windows. Too. Yeah. I think Sterling and Mark, if I recall the paperwork, the decision was based on the windows more than the, what the walls could take. So I don't think we've got, I'm not sure uh, what the limiting factor at the wastewater treatment facility was, but. It's the height of the water on the building. That was done by a structural engineer. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll okay. we follow up in a bit. Someone will tell us. It'd be nice not to deviate from their deadline and giving their standards. Yeah, track. that's what I was yeah. going to say. I'm for this, but I want to make sure that this is top priority and moving forward. Yeah, we stop. do have a little time because we can't do anything until yeah. you know, spring so, time. Um, so maybe um, uh, I'm wondering just how I could walk away today um, with some sort of I, I'm sensing there's support from the board. Okay. I, I think we just need a structural engineer to evaluate. Okay. And yeah. you and I can get together on a structural engineer okay. um, this week. Mm -hmm. well, we can pay for it, can't we? Okay. Yeah. Let's wait. Let's see what we find. Yeah. Oh, we can pay for the engineer. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let's get a. We can. Can we get a, a vote for that? Um, Authorizing uh, Brian to secure an in structural engineer for the library. Yeah, so moved. A motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Um, I actually had a comment. Okay. But um, just a heads up the village had to hire a structural engineer for the power house um, foundation. We already have a contact with it. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, Jasmine, can we get together? Uh, something. Tomorrow at two o'clock. <clears throat> You don't have a calendar in front of you. But, <laughs> um, Our children are on school break. <laughs> it's yeah. very difficult to get together to do in the afternoon. I could do Wednesday. I could also uh, email you tonight and we can chat. Yeah, let's do that. My Wednesday isn't great, but let's try it. I just want to make sure that we follow up with this yeah. quickly. No, go ahead. I also um, just say out loud for the record, on the record, <laughs> that um, we are um, enthusiastically wanting to purchase these 
with the understanding that Jean, nor Kristen, nor volunteers would be putting these in. Is that is that kind of where we're at as a that's a good question. We, we have not decided that. I have not even spoken to the Public Works Department yet. Um, Would you like me to talk to somebody? There is uh, we have limited <laughs> resources. Yeah. I'm, I'll say, and I, uh, I agree with you, that that's, I mean, my sense is that, that we need uh, our Public Works Department, or if, if not, then perhaps the Fire Department. To be assigned to, to do this. <coughs> it did say um, that the deploy time is 10 minutes. 10 minutes. So, 10. But, you, but you can't yep. be putting out fires and doing other stuff at the same time. There will be a hierarchy of needs. You know? Uh huh. So, I, under I understand that. I absolutely understand that. But this is a big asset right now, I will say. I think we need to protect our town buildings first and foremost, for sure, and um, especially a public building that gets so much, so much use. And um, we discussed at the Cat Four exercise that our public works could, um, since the library is usually the first thing to get hit, based on where they're located in the floodplain, that that could happen preemptively. Like if we are, you know, especially if it's ten minutes the night before, get our guys over there, put them up, mm -hmm. and then it's we can all sleep, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sleep peacefully. I don't think that's a huge ask. Jason. I just got a question about it. <clears throat> Are they something that are outside? Because during the Halloween storm, it was two o'clock in the morning, and we were out, and the roads were fine. As far as by the library, by the time we got back, we got to it down for about an hour. Water was up. So it was something something that's outside or do we have access to them there? They're outside. Yeah. It'd be, I'm assuming it'll be a similar setup to what the Sterling Market's got, uh, some lock box on the outside of the building and they're stored in there and somebody's going to have to have the key and mm -hmm. have access to it and all that. We haven't got there. Have you guys seen these things work? The floodgates? Does it work? Oh yeah. Yeah. That's what Sterling Market's got. Sure. The sewer plants got. Um, they're putting them in the post office. We're gonna put them in the library. They work. They really work well. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we'll go with the structure engineer and then go from there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I think no. I think ja I think Jasmine and the trustees um, would like to walk away with some. You know. With a consensus that we are going to absolutely have people in place to manage these floodgates, and I'm very much in favor of our public works crew doing that. Do you have feedback? Uh, I don't have a problem. It's not a big deal. Okay, and it probably will be assigned to you. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any objection to it on the board? Certainly not. We're not going to ask it. anybody that works in a library to take care of it. It is a town asset. We need to take care of it. I would say that this is a triage situation. You should do this first. And if you can't, if it doesn't happen, it could be that nobody else is left to do it. You know, that's the way it is. I mean, we, when we, when the training's provided on how to install these, probably, and they're probably not complicated. I got no clue, but. Uh, the fire department should be, you know, briefed on them as well. So sure. yeah. whoever is available, because you may not be available if it's. Well, I would, I, I would probably see the situation that what happens most often is we have to do it ahead of time. Yeah. So we only have to stop fixing the road or stop cutting the trees yeah. or come back and do it. Right. They'd already be in place because there is more than one door. They don't right. need that access. Right. We, at the training we talked a little bit about scheduling it like when you go to run the roads like the first thing you do if you're gonna run the roads would be put up the gates mm -hmm. like even before you verified how bad it is any place else 
just because the library is one of the first places that floods, yeah. <clears throat> you can go see what it looks like out behind the library and put up the gates while you're there. But I think that's kind of how it would have to, the expectation would be that it, it has to get done really early on because if it doesn't get done early, it's too, late. Uh, it's too late. The water comes up so quickly there that it it goes. It's early or it's too late. There's <coughs> and it is an emergency situation. When emergencies happen, you can't really plan out. Sometimes things don't go just the way you yeah. planned it. So we know that it might not happen, but we hope it okay. in, in that context, uh, you don't always know. Like, like Jason said, that when they went by, everything looked good an hour later, it wasn't so good. We know the water can come up very, very quickly. One thing that I would encourage the board to do as you think about your next plan, and you talked about it a little bit at the DEM meeting, follow-up meeting was perhaps establish uh, a list of core volunteers. Um, and that could certainly be an activity that, you know, one or more volunteers could do if the highway department couldn't get to it for some reason. Mm -hmm. Just something to think about. As I, a, I personally would be willing to volunteer to go help with the floodgates and help with the other stuff. As a contingency, I think that's a good idea, but I think we do need to have someone who has primary responsibility. Absolutely. I agree totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that volunteers should be a backup in the event that an emergency happens and yeah. know, all hell is breaking yeah. loose and these guys are out and can't come back. And you will absolutely be the Number one volunteer. <laughs> oh. So thank you. Duncan's point no, is exactly. I, I'd, I'd be happy to be trained to you. I'm within five minute walking to the library. So people are stuck. I mean, but I think there should be primary and then plan B, Continue. plan C. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Duncan's point is exactly the point I was trying to make that, you know, there's a need to be an A and a need to be. And Jasmine had said, and not volunteers. And I think that volunteers might be, you know, C. 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 Yeah. yeah. Not volunteers as A. Yeah, Not absolutely. Volunteers. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thanks okay. for right. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thanks for your strong commitment to the library. I appreciate that. It feels like we would be able to proceed and cover the structural engineering and inform the funds on the Perfect. Okay. Uh, you want to jump out to the legislators? They're all here. They're all here. It's just about eight o'clock. So, yeah. yep. thank you guys for coming in tonight. Uh, we just wanted to have a little time with you before you your session reconvenes. Where the hell is he? Here? There he is. Uh, there were two positions the board has taken. Uh, that was one on uh, the Senate passed it. It was the uh, giving a certain level of total <coughs> control uh, in the house somewhere now and they anticipate it probably will come out sometime this session uh there was a lead resolution that we signed on to as well as the uh strong indication marijuana is going to be legalized in the next session and the well, maybe not so strong well it is legal the problem is right now it's not um, regulated um, right. And, um, but the Senate passed was regulated. We got back legalization. And, um, my hope would be that we have a regulated market that allows municipalities to sell. That's what the position we had, just that we would be able to opt in as other communities would or wouldn't. Okay, so other than that, uh, you guys want to open with some of the things that you anticipate are, are ahead of us? Oh, uh, the first one was a, it, it, it authorized a certain level of local control that we don't have now. And uh, it came out of Brattleboro. The Senate approved it. It went over to the House and it's somewhere in one of the committees, but they anticipate it'll be coming out this next session. Thank you. I'll go first, I guess. Uh, I'm assuming the, the local control part is probably the gov ops. Maybe it'll probably come out okay. fairly quickly. So the reason I was shaking my head now about the regulation part is, um, uh, it, it, unfortunately, in my opinion, the, the speaker has essentially not put it on the priority list. Um, 
And so it is what it is. If it happens to, to make its way and not go onto the floor, that'll be one thing. But it's not, it doesn't seem to be a priority. Um, so, so you know, things change. You know, I'm not saying something good now. Um, but um, so there's lots of unfinished business um, that you know didn't happen the first year that I am. Um, and then part of uh, what I've been doing lately is there was a bill that didn't come out um, through a conference committee, which I, I chair the conference committee, and it's about uh, that's a lot about unemployment and workers' comp and things and you know, classification and all those very exciting things that nobody gets to talk about because nobody wants to talk about. And uh, it's all the back end of business stuff, and um, and so that will probably come out quickly. It's not um, it shouldn't have an impact on, on local governments really, but uh, that's what I've been working on lately. In fact, as early as this morning, I'm working on it and still and trying to hash out a deal with the Senate. And I'm on economic and uh, commerce, so we do a lot of workforce development stuff too. And I hope this year I, we continue our workforce development stuff. We have the tech center in Hyde Park that does great work. Um, and they have a great facility to do all that great work. But their utilization rate has not been great. It's been okay. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for young, you know, young adults to get in there and go to college. It's not way back when it was like, oh, you're not going to go to college, you go to tech center. Well, that's not what it is anymore. Um, these kids go through the tech center and they get a great job and they get great opportunities outside in the workforce. And so I have been hammering on that for the past two and a half, three years, and I will continue to do that. Um, and, uh, and then that's just kind of things that are on the top of my mind right now, but there's plenty of other things that are flying down and I think the answer to help you with this. I'll pass it off. All right, Dan. So I'm on the Human Services Committee, and uh, basically that committee looks at Department of Health, Department of Children and Families, Department of Aging and Independent Living. And I've been working on some legislation with Teresa Wood from Waterbury to create the Older Vermonters Act. And basically what this is, is we brought together all the agencies to provide services to older Vermonters because one in four Vermonters are gonna be over the age of 65 in 10 years. So what, what, uh, what we're trying to do is just think about how the agency, the Department of Aging and Independent Living works with um, Meals on Wheels and nursing homes and all the different um, providers of services and how do we know people are going to be better off? How do we integrate the services so that we can work together and really measure outcomes? And, you know, look at where, um, uh, you know, really start planning for this shift in demographics and what that's going to look like. So that's a pro something that Teresa Wood and I have been working on. We go back to Ledge Council tomorrow for a final draft and uh, it will be taken up in the second week of the session in the Human Services Committee. Sorry, I'm like okay. trying to catch between my and That's okay. <laughs> so, uh, so um, yeah, that's one of the ones that I've been really um, spending a lot of time on this summer, but I'm also, you know, interested in and your concerns, obviously, that's this is the time I want to hear before the session starts. But, you know, I'm really interested in making sure that college is uh, is funded and there's uh, it's not in my committee. But, you know, I'm down there every day talking to people and that will be one of the things that I'm very much focused on. So uh, I think all of us, we all graduated from there. So <laughs> I don't think we want to see it go anywhere. And it's important. So not only to the community, but to us individually. So, uh, and I'll let Senate go, Senate goes last. Uh, we always go last. <laughs> so, um, I want to start by saying that for me, um, if there's any way to get money to um, the state college system, I'm um, all for that. Um, the bind that we're in is 50, every single year because of inflation, the um, um, income tax goes up, sales tax revenues go up, and um, rooms and meals go up. And so every year you can expect, as long as the economy doesn't go down, a two to three percent increase in our revenues in the state. Half of all that revenue in the last five years has gone to fund um, state employees retirement and teachers retirement. And so half of all of our new revenue 
goes to do commitments that were made long ago. And we underfunded um, particularly teachers' retirement um, in the 1990s with health care expansions. So we're, and we're looking at half of all that new revenue going away because of those things. And the Green Mountain Care Board has sent a letter to the governor's office saying that to fund one care and more primary care in the state, basically our health care initiatives, they need $13 million in state revenue to do that. That ends up killing any effort to put any money any place else in state revenue if that happens. Um, and serving on a money committee, um, it puts us in the bind between health care. I don't know what we do about um, retirement plans unless um, we dive in and make some very hard decisions and on contract relation, uh, relations between teachers and um, state employees, but that's a longer term. <clears throat> so it really does pit health care against higher education. And I have to tell you at this point, um, I would do anything to make sure that um, um, the state college system got money. So um, that's just in a broad brush, and I can go into detail, but it doesn't seem like this is the place. Um, my most important thing in this county, um, um, that school up on the hill is um, uh, as important as anything. Kyle? Okay. Uh, but isn't there money for higher education? It's just the majority of it goes to UVM. Isn't it a like a, a so um, so here's yeah, you know we rank um, 49th in the country in our funding for higher education in total. A piece of it goes to um, um, uh, the university. A piece of it goes to um, um, the state college system. And if, to be completely honest, my employer's VSAC and a piece goes to VSAC. And the money that comes to VSAC goes to low income kids to subsidize the care in, in that piece. Um, I would say to you, from my point of view, um, ranking 49th in the country is not a place that we want to be. And if you want to end up having a fight between the state college system, um, VSAC, <coughs> and the university, if you want to have that fun, we're never going to get any more money into higher education to support kids. And um, we'll end up um, forming a circle around everybody that gets money for higher ed and shooting at each other and not talking about the fact that we're supporting that in the country. Only New Hampshire is lower in their funding for higher education than um, than Vermont as a percentage of what we do. And I might say also from the university's point of view, and one of the things that I would like to, and this is personally something that I plan on raising in the Appropriations Committee, they get about $40 million a year. Of that $40 million a year, 25% of it is dedicated to the medical school. So um, UVM Medical gets $10 million. And so if you take that piece out, they don't get any more than the state colleges do. And we're all the time um, complaining that we don't, and, and if you look at the demographics, we don't have enough um, primary care doctors in Vermont. And we are um, um, heading to a place where we have a crisis in primary care doctors in Vermont. And this community is a total example of that. Because we, we can't find a primary care doctor to come in and take Paul Rogers' place. 
And I want to, um, I would much rather stay at the university and you still get to keep your $10 million, but you can't use it to educate just across the board. You have to put it towards primary care doctors. And the university needs to produce more primary care doctors because we have a crisis. It wants to stay in Vermont. Can they tap some of the funding that's going to the college for programs that say you need to come to rural Vermont? I, that I'm basically saying you have to produce primary care doctors. And the backside of that for me would be yes, they have to stay here, but they need to produce primary care doctors because that's where it emerges. I'll to add to Kylie's point as well as they can too. So uh, UVM gets 40 million. I think the state college gets a similar amount. Yeah. Um, but it's split between you know, five entities. Um, so it, it does feel unfair. I'd, I'd agree with the side of the side of that. We can't be happy to send the infighting. The fact of the matter is we're not finding the way we should be. Especially, you know, I think Vermont society in general really values on higher education. Um, so we should bottom line is it needs to be better. And, and I think everyone in the legislature knows we're having a crisis with primary care physicians just because the reimbursement rate to pay their college loans. Um, you know, I think that's a priority, you know, not only in the legislature, but, you know, Senator Westman and I serve on the copy board and we talk about that as, as well. So but I do think that that $10 million should just go, it should say, you need to produce primary care doctors and they need to stay here. Mm -hmm. I mean, the bottom line is we need physicians that are going to stay here. Forget primary care. Look at Mansfield Orthopedic. They're, they bring in a lot of revenue to our to our area. We have people flying in from other states to go there. So I think it's more than just primary care. I totally get what you mean by that. We have the crisis in primary care. I mean, Dr. Baloo, who's a pediatrician, has been trying to fill her spot for years. And she she's, wants to retire. She's nearly retired. Right? She's been trying to retire um, for a few years now. So, um, but I think it's bigger than just primary care. I think it's just keeping doctors here. You know, it's real, real. If you have a choice, you have primary care. My I go to Express Care in Waterbury for my primary care. They're awesome. I love going there. It's a clinic, they're great. So, so I'll open this up. Any board members got anything else they'd like to bring up to legislators and then we'll open it up to the public as well. Yeah, I'm, just, uh, I'm glad that NVU has been the primary focus of this conversation. I think I hope it's the primary focus of most of your conversations down there. And what I've been saying to legislators is I come across them as a the chancellor <coughs> that Northern Vermont University is part of that demographic problem. The solution to that demographic problem that you were alluding to earlier that the number of people that we encounter and, and um, deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that are living in Vermont because of NVU is um, very significant. And um, that should be part of the pitch, I think, that having NVU is a part of the solution to that demographic problem. So <clears throat> thanks. I, I, I say a little time, but I've said on the floor of the house during debates often too, so the uh, NV, you know, the, the state college system in general yep. has about 80% Vermonters. So, I mean, we are really investing in our, in our people when we invest in the state college system. So, I guess it's a no brainer. In my mind. The uh, road classification system in Vermont is falling apart. Um, and it's falling apart because of the uh, a and R rule of hydrologically connected. Uh, they we are essentially uh, in the portion that's falling apart is class four. Uh, class four roads are we had only to deal with water before. Now we are being going to mandate it to take care of them as if they're third class roads. There are all sorts of policy, you know, expenses related to that. Um, and we as a community are looking at, uh, we've, we've tasked our uh, uh, planning commission to say, what should we do? We wanted to keep these, which we viewed as uh, class four roads as 
for the future uh, public. You know, we didn't want to abandon them, turn them into trails. Now there's every financial incentive uh, on earth in favor of our turning them over and letting them go. Well, that's that's losing some of our future. That's losing infrastructure or rights away that'll be nearly impossible to, to create again. And we, uh, the out for us right now is that if we if we unload these things and turn them into trails, we they'll be just as hydrologically connected to the you know, to the rivers and streams, but we won't have an obligation financially to to maintain them in third class roads, uh, yeah. which is our going to be our job. And so, uh, you know, we really could use you folks to straighten that mess out for us. There's going to be a lot of discussion around stormwater runoff, not only for municipalities, but for businesses. And when you look at the three acre rule that's coming into effect, I mean, we all want to make sure that our lake is clean, our rivers are clean, but we've got to find that balance. And we're kind of stuck in between federal requirements to clean up Lake Champlain and then how we're going to implement that. And um, I know that Senator Westman was just down in Stowe talking about it. I'll let him talk about that because I don't know the details. But when you look at, as you were talking about, Doug, that there's um, the financial impact to not only businesses, but municipalities is going to be, it's going to be, I don't know how we're going to make it happen, but um, you know we've got to try to figure this out. But uh, I don't have an answer. I don't. But what did you find in so What was the? I mean, they did some inventory. Talk about that. No, I mean it's, I mean, it's, it's going to be with every town. It's going to be the same, uh, whether it's Wilkin or Johnson or whatever. When you start looking at what we're asked to um, come into compliance with. Under that current regulation, what was, what was the amount per mile? So, um, still is one of the first towns in the county to complete the assessment of what it will take to bring their roads up to compliance to deal with the runoff of the lake. And, um, you know, I know that um, the County Planning Commission is doing an assessment. For a number of communities around the county. And so they're talking um, someplace between three and five hundred thousand dollars a year increase in their town budget for the next 20 years to be able to do that. And they are talking about nearly 50 projects every year for the next 16 years to be able to do that. What that's going to do is if they're any example of what that will take to pick up. It's going to open the door to have um, a discussion about the timeline for um, all of the lake cleanup stuff that we're moving towards and the three acre rule that's around that. Um, the only encouragement I could give Stowe is, or give um, Johnson is the quicker you can get to some place where you have on paper what you're going to need to become compliant, the more facts that we can bring to the legislature, that the more it helps us to be able to talk about um, those things in a way that um, will really affect what the decisions are going to be. Brian, can you have that next week? <laughs> Give it to me. Uh, Kim, then Shane. As, as legislators, you, know, you guys tie things, tie money to the, the, the bills that you're passing. When it, it happened with energy, it's happening with the water runoff, and and so these come down to the municipal level where um, commissions and select boards are supposed to be implementing these things, and yet there's no funding tied to it, and that's really critical. I think that as as you guys, that's something to work toward and say, wait a minute, stop. We can't pass this without some support to the municipalities. Good point. And you can't find future legislatures with um, financial, but they also don't like dedicated funds. So, well, but you raise a good point. I, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but if we don't know what the cost is, then don't pass it, it yet. Then get <laughs> the money down in the future. So, so um, I, here's what I just say to you. That's way too simplistic. 
Um, we are under a um, um, uh, an agreement with the feds that by um, 2035, we will have um, enough projects to reduce the phosphorus going into the lake to meet their requirements. So we had no choice around whether or not to agree to the 2035 level, or they would have come in from um, Boston um, in the, um, the federal environmental district that we're in, and they would have told us what we were going to do um, <coughs> on the federal level to do that. So, so would they have supported you with the funding to do it? No. They don't. <laughs> That's what we're looking no. For. <laughs> so, but we're in the position of having to meet that that outward deadline. If we work diligently to try to make some of those goals, and we get to like 2030 and say there's no way we can meet the 2036, I think we can get them to move. But if we haven't done anything or done any of the work, they're going to come in and they're going to tell us what to do. So my encouragement to you is give us facts about what it would take, particularly at the town level, to pick your roads up to what those rules are. Work with um, um, LCPC to do that. Work with whoever you can to do that. Maybe you should send Brian out to, to measure everything. <laughs> but the more factual information we have to be able to put together the plan to address what the costs are, the quick, the better off we are. Um, I would tell you there is no way if the snow plan is exactly what is going to happen around across the rest of the county. It doesn't matter about the money. We don't have the engineers to, to um, design the projects that they are suggesting that need to be done. We physically couldn't do it if we had all the money in the world. But we need to have the factual information to be able to bring to the legislature. The, legis the state agreed to a deadline with the feds because we were under the gun. And there's deadlines that all fit with that. And we need facts to be able to take to the legislature to say, this isn't realistic. And I also think that they're going to start looking at more impact that agriculture has on, on the lake and, and how they can work with, with agriculture to reduce that, that runoff as well. I mean, I think um, just try to meet those goals. It's not just municipalities or businesses. There's also going to be agriculture in the mix. Which is 90% of the problem. Which is uh, 40% of the problem. And what is roads? Uh, so uh, roads would be someplace um, 14 to 20. Significantly less, I guess. As, as long as you don't consider the impact of agricultural runoff into the highway system, which ends up in the Shane, you did something? Yeah. Um, so I, this is the reason I came out tonight, was this, this road thing. Uh, it, it concerns me because of the, the unfunded mandates, like Kim was saying, but also, I think the way you guys, I'm saying you guys as the whole legislature, pass down the rules and the regulations after you make law is part of the problem here too, because instead of you guys, the legislature, being the one sitting down and making the rules, talk, you know, talking to your constituents and figuring out how these things are going to impact the towns, it's a and R who passes down the rules and regulations and the legislature gives them the authority to pass down the rules and regs. And, you know, one of those rules is something that's gonna hit this town pretty hard. You know, the, um, if it's a more than 10 degree incline, the road has to be adjusted within what, the next five years? As Richie was just saying, we don't, like, we can't do that. And uh, so, I mean, you know, well, to get to what Richie was saying, I think we need numbers. Stowe's numbers can be extrapolated, <coughs> but LCPC, I think, probably needs to do something for the whole county and, and tell us what it's going to cost um, and specifically 
you know, towns like Johnson, Velvety or Woolkit that have a lot of hilly areas that, you know, are going to be hit hard by this. Can I ask Brian Carlos a question? <laughs> Haven't LCPC been doing some work in Johnson on, on these roads and, you know, what is it? They've been doing needed? some surveys, yeah. I think the latest one was the erosion survey. You know, as far as I understand what Richard Westman is saying about numbers, what I, what they've offered us in, that's causing us problems and, you know, like running for the bolt hole is that uh, if we, if we change our classifications, we don't have to change our, don't have to change how we deal with them. You know, that puts a lot of pressure on us, on us to be quite stupid. And we can do that on our own. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've heard Bill Miller cool is thing actively heard exploring, season. turning a lot of their class fours into trails. We don't know what our, you know, we heard tonight that, that Kim said that the report will be coming in. You know, but we don't know what it said, but they're from talking mm -hmm. to the road guy at LCPC, a lot of towns are doing what you're saying Belvedere might be doing. They're, they are looking to say, because we're accountable for tax dollars, we're looking to, to uh, you know, and that's those roads will be just as hydrologically connected, you know, no matter what their classification. But at least if you turn them into legal trails, um, the, the right of way still exists. That's right. So you could go through the process of, you know, as hard as it would be if you needed it at some point in the future, you could. You wouldn't lose the right of way. And just one quick comment Lamar County Planning Commission has funding enough to do about three surveys a year for towns. So, it, and they're not complete surveys. I mean, you, Brian, you guys aren't going to get. A, uh, a detailed report on what the cost of doing all these things is. You're going to get a listing of hydrologic, hydrologically connected roads with certain percentage slopes, and then they're not going to give you uh, a list that says it's going to cost you three hundred thousand dollars a year. Stowe has that because they have professional staff within their um, highway department. They paid forty thousand dollars for theirs. Yeah, well, they, yeah. They, they hired, they hired, they hired an outside they yeah. hired a, and I don't see that happening in the rest of it. It isn't. It isn't. <laughs> so what you're talking about that Doug, is going to happen because you won't have any choice. You know, you're going to look at those class four roads and you're going to say, <coughs> we got to do a massive reclassification for legal trail. No. Brian has done some great work on developing cost estimates that we use when we're scoping up projects about what we think it's going to cost you know per segment for certain conditions that we can see but that's not an engineer's report it gets us a little bit further along but um <coughs> some some segments and some projects need an engineer and we we can't do that in-house um you know so we're not going to get a survey of the level of detail that stowe has been able to prepare but we'll be we're working on our uh, MRGP planning, and we do have to submit. I, I'm not saying, I I think there's no way that most of the towns in the rest of the county are going to be able to replicate what Stowe's done. But the more information we have to be able to back that up, the better chance we've got. The, the first deadline in this is 2025. Yep. And the, the, we, the more information we have, the better chance we've got to be able to push some of those deadlines back and to be able to um, get more realistic about what the state can contribute to our towns, um, make their plans, and do projects that will, will do that. But information will give us a lot better chance to be effective. So, yeah, Greg, you did have your hand up. Uh, I think that when we talk about municipalities, we might forget about people. You know, we keep saying, oh, the municipality, but it's the people in the town that are going to pay for this, right? So let's think about that. <clears throat> the other thing I think about, and I've talked to some folks about it, is that if we can get to the total daily phosphorus load, 
it would just fix the farms. And we don't need to do all this work to reach that goal. We don't. If we if we fix the farms, I say we have an impact fee and we take that money and go and fix the farms. Because that's where you're gonna hit your you're gonna make your your load right there. All this other work, we're gonna spend millions and tens of millions of dollars, and it's not gonna do a lot of impact to Lake Champlain. My law, I figured I'd get a put probably 50 to 100,000 to get it to compliance. And I don't dump two five gallon pails of sediment in our river a year. Where a farm has a big storm, it's tons. And that's where we should be concentrating. This whole idea of making towns go through this in business is it's all backwards because we've got to hit where the biggest impact is. And I think if we work as a team, I don't want to call farmers out. I want to say, hey, we want to help you. Let's work together. And we can hit, we can make our goal. The other thing I don't like about this is that New York doesn't have the same rules. And, and the reason is, the way I understand it, and these guys can correct me if I'm wrong, please. The Conservation Law Foundation sued the state of Vermont, right? To get this law passed. That's how this all got going, is because a bunch of lawyers from Boston came up here and said, Well, Vermont, you should be doing this. Now, I don't know if that's right or wrong, that's what I read. I don't think they should have a say on how we run our state. We can do that ourselves. We don't need them to do that. So that's kind of my point. We got to hit the farms in a, in, a, in a way that we can work together, not by throwing shit at them, but just, you know, hey, let's work together. And uh, I think we'd save a lot of money. I think we could attain our goal for probably less than half of the money. <coughs> I don't have figures, but I, you know, I'm using a little common sense. And, uh, just, just on that point, I'll say that um, there has been many conversations in the legislature about, you know, the value of your investment, and where, where it should go, where it should go. And farms have been by five plus. Yeah. The state, you know, wants to help, and uh, you know, there's complicated stuff to be had there. Um, but, I, but I would say that you know, often the uh, it gets a lot of attention when there's a you know, sewer overflow or this or that. And, and it's true, it does happen. It's certainly not helping anything. It's, it's a real pain in everyone's butt. But uh, the amount of money it would cost to bring those facilities up to date and, and running is far more, and, and, and the impact on the waterways is. Far less. So, like what Greg is saying, you know, you find the value in the dollars and it's, it's, it's in the agriculture sector. Um, Scott, but we got to get this wrapped up. I know we've had you guys here for over a half hour and um, appreciate you coming in. And we, you know, just a note that we would be available anytime you need us during the le legislative session if you need some help. Uh, and we'll be watching what you're doing. Scott. So yeah, it's just a follow up on the on the sewer overflow issue into Lake Champlain, from the waterways leading to Lake Champlain. As a village trustee, every time somebody wants to hook up to the municipal sewer system, we talk about capacity and can the facility handle the capacity. And what I see in Burlington, I'm gonna name them because that's what I see in the news, is they consistently um, have spillage into the lake, but yet the city is developing at a pretty high rate. What is the reasoning for this? I mean, if it was Johnson and we overflowed with the village system, we started having a lot of ethanol getting into the Lamoille River, eventually getting to the Lamoille um, and Lake Champlain. I, I think we would be dragged through the mud and there would be some issues with having an overtax system while we're developing and putting people on it. Why isn't that the case for growing in middle area? So the other thing I think is, I think it is the case. Let's you know you. Uh, there's often a, a, a thing where you, you find somebody for for doing what you think they should be doing. You take you take money out of the system, but then expect them to you know, fix this with the problem. Um, you know, so there, there's a balance act to be had here. And as far as uh, you know, Burlington's got to step up. They got to do a thing. My point, my my point was just about Burlington. It was about a town like Johnson that. Are, you know, you could 
make huge investments in the wastewater system here, but it's not going to, you know, that's going to be a lot of money to be spent, and it's not going to do anything. So, so my point about the, you know, the wastewater system was, you know, locally, and I don't really know about Brunton. Yeah, let's put, let's put the money where the value is and not spend money on it. It just, it just seems like rural communities, especially Johnson, are struggling to get people to live here, pay taxes, get good jobs. And the bigger, you know, cities in Vermont have their issues and they seem like they're unchecked. And it's frustrating. Yeah, a little sure, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really, you know, Brompton's got a hard time to play. They have a lot of stuff right now. And it, it, it's, it's not like you know, people in Wilmot County go to Chinning County to work often. You know, they live by the people So it's um, you know, to to, to you know to, to just throw everything at Brown and say you guys are the bad guys out of town. Well, the impact on the lake is huge when you're on the sewage. Sure, well, and, and also all the fires that are going up and down the river that are really on top of it. And I think the farming community is starting to step up. I mean, there's been a lot of training, a lot of buy-in, a lot of grants given out. So it, I, I hate to throw the farmers completely in shell when we have large municipalities being reckless, irresponsible. With their growth. So you guys want any closing statements or otherwise just appreciate you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, coming in. Yeah. And, you're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. And we can always, you know, we're always open. Yeah. Um, our emails are online. It's probably the best way to contact me anyway. Um, so, yeah, our emails are on the state web, the Vermont Legislature website. We're always open for comments. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if anyone wants to come to the state house, come on down. Tour your around, we'll show you the secret passages. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll go back into your yep. uh, the update. Yeah, so we're we have a sometimes refer to it as a road naming ordinance, but it's really a policy. Um, the Historical Society has proposed an update to our street naming policy to better reflect their role. Uh, so that we make, we've made reference a number of times that we want to consult the Historical Society when we have to name a road, but it's kind of not well defined uh, what their role is. So in your packet, uh, a proposed addition to our uh, our policy for naming roads. Uh, this says draft proposed amendment to Town of Johnson 911 street name right. ordinance. This is the same thing we got emailed out to. Yes, it is. Yeah. So what are we looking? It's a proposal to come in from the Historical Society looking yep. for adoption. Yep. Can Just to a, a little background. Please? Sure. So we we thought it was appropriate to try and take this on because we had seen a number of times when it come up in discussions at your level. We thought, geez, if we did this, maybe it would take one thing off your off your plan. So that's the that's the, was the purpose of the attempt. The Historical Society was to try and put forth a proposal that makes it more clear what the actual involvement of the historical society would be in this process. To be clear, um, my belief, at least personally, is that you should amend your 911 road naming ordinance. Um, there's probably other things in here that you could look at. But if, the, if you want to have any teeth, this really should be in the ordinance rather than the policy. Our recommendation is that you treat this as a policy until such time as you can amend your ordinance. But the, the basic concept here is um, a road name would be submitted to the Historical Society. The Historical Society would uh, solicit 
uh, names from either the developer or residents on the road that had to receive a new name. Uh, we would certainly try to have a consensus process where the name that we recommended to you would be a consensus name for the owners, developer, whatever. Um, but our intent would be to assign a name with some level of historic significance to the town of Allison in that process. And then we would have the final vote on that still then. You would have the final vote on that. And again, the, the people living on the road or the developer, as the case may be, if they were aggrieved of, you know, if we couldn't come to a consensus, they would have ultimately the ability to propose a name to you guys as well. Um, and you would be the final arbiter of what that name was. But the, the intent here really is to try and make sure that there's a small example, when I worked in the town of Georgia, we had a guy that proposed a name. He was Champlain Door Company, and he wanted to name his road Doorway. Doorway. <laughs> um, the historical society didn't think that was a particularly appropriate name. The select board didn't either. So he didn't get Doorway. Um, but, you know, that it's that kind of thing that we think is important to try and get names to you know, have some sort of relative significance to the town. Who typically does this in other towns? I question it because I just question the historical society being the ones to it's, oversee it. I think it's town dependent. We can designate whomever. Ultimately, it's a select board. We have to name it. But we had in the past had our listers doing it. Um, yeah. And because Rose retired, no longer a lister, we passed it on to the historical society in the thought that there could be some historical significance that we would want to capture. I get all that. What yep. I don't understand is why is there an effort to change it from a policy to an ordinance? Because in my view, just serving on different committees over the years, Committee involvement is truly about the representatives on boards or committees. And select boards being a town um, entity through statute of the state um, is very different than historical societies that I understand that they likely live. However, as people are no longer on a historical society, there are situations I'm sure that come up where they're not as well represented as we are right now, um, where the select board always will be well represented. So I just don't understand why we would change it from a policy to an ordinance. So if if I can. Yeah, go ahead. That's not going to affect, that, that won't change anything. But what this really does is, as, this is how we've been doing it. This is just formalizing the relationship. That we've the policy is formal. Yeah. The policy is not binding. It's not binding, that's right. Yep. And the ordinance as it stands right now doesn't specify who it leaves it up to the select board, which the proposal also, the ultimate decision is the select boards. The the, the difference is the historical society would have a role in that by making the recommendations. It formalizes that we will ask the historical society for their input. We don't have to wait for their input. We don't have to follow their input. Everything is still up to the select board. It's just right now we do ask the historical society if they have any thoughts. And this just commits us to we will ask the historical society for their thoughts. Maybe I misunderstood all this about a year ago. There was some talk about the cemetery commissions and wanting to do some work on the cemetery and not being able to do so because there weren't people on that, that were able to say yes or no to it. I, I, maybe I misunderstood this. Yeah. That was a yeah. dissolved cemetery. That was a so that, 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 that's beast. Yeah, a this totally is a similar beast. situation. No, I, I just no. wondered if we put it in ordinance that. If they're like, you know, she was saying, no, th th this it will the sole decision making authority will always remain with the select board. All this does is the select board will ask if there's an opinion. If somehow the historical society suddenly had no more members, 
it would still be up to the select board to make the decision. Uh, it doesn't obligate us to do to do anything other than been asked, which again we're currently doing. I would, I would also point out that this proposal formalizes the process where hopefully we will not have the whole point of 911 naming is to provide emergency services with no confusion. So the goal of 911 road naming is not to have a similar name or sounding name in Cambridge, in Johnson, in Eden. Um, you know, there needs to be a differentiation. So this proposal requires you guys to submit proposed names to the U.S. Postal Service to make sure that there's not, you know, a, a naming conflict into emergency service providers. I can tell you right now, there are at least a couple of situations that we know of where there are identical road names and identical addresses between Johnson and Eaton, for example. That's not supposed to happen. That's a real issue for 911 emergency responders. It ain't supposed to happen. It never should have happened. It did. I don't know how it did, but it did. Um, and this would hopefully eliminate that by requiring you to submit proposed names to emergency service providers <coughs> and to U.S. Postal Service. Jackie? Um, what was the impetus for the formalization of this since it's been working and it just, what, I, 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 don't, I don't get it. Oh, I'm not sure. There's a little bit of history there. We informally asked for the historical society some number of years ago to take this on and at least give us first brush at a highway naming. And uh, the historical society just sort of wondered what their role was and questioned it and why they were involved. And it sort of, we tried to formalize it a little more. And I guess, I'm not sure if we asked you or if this is on your own, you're coming up with a proposed policy. But it's to remove the ambiguity, is what basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's to try and clarify and identify in a formal way the role of the historical society in this process. If you guys decide you don't want to do it, we don't really care. Yeah. We, we would like to see, and we believe that it's a good idea to try and make names that have historical significance. And there are a number of communities throughout the state that have their historical societies, you know, perform this, this role. Um, but if you guys say you want to do it, knock yourselves out. I think that one of the critical pieces though is in your ordinance does not currently require it, even though the road naming standard promulgated by the state 911 board requires it, you do not have it in your ordinance right now that you will submit proposed names to the Postal Service and emergency service providers so there's not a conflict in the road name. And that that really needs to happen regardless of the historical society's society is in my opinion. Okay, so what's the board's pleasure? We do have a policy proposal before us from the historical society. We certainly don't, you know, it wasn't our intent that you act on this immediately. Okay. Take take time to, you know, review well, it and do what do whatever you want. Does the board feel comfortable acting tonight, or do we want to table it, study it a little more? I don't think there's a problem with adopting it. It just seems to be a clarification. It's it's uh, you know giving them their marching orders. I think it's always good if we can delegate something and get more consideration, and then it comes back to us. We still retain the authority. I don't see a problem with adopting it. Is that a motion? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're adopting this as a policy or more? It's policy. policy. It's a policy. Yeah, the policy makes sense to me. We got a motion. Do we have a second? Oh, a second. We got a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Ayes have it. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> and thank you guys for help. <laughs> Uh, finance committee. Yeah, I guess I started maybe a little bit of ball rolling on that by bringing it up again. Um, so my, I guess my proposal to you guys is for you to at least consider the possibility 
of establishing either what you call it, what you want, a finance committee or a budget advisory committee. Um, essentially, it would be a committee made up of general citizenry that you guys would set the parameters as to what you wanted them to review in terms of uh, your overall budget or finances of the community. But for example, Cambridge does this, they've done it since 1974. I think I sent you guys out an email of um, what their baseline is for doing that. Uh, and I, I think you really would need to look at Johnson's specific thing. You can't just you know do what Cambridge does because they've got different communities. But basically what Cambridge does and what a lot of other communities do um, is they have a citizen group in, in Cambridge case, I think it's either seven or nine members. Um, they're appointed by the select board, um, but they're general citizens and they look at specific areas of the budget which have been designated by the board for review. So for example, in Cambridge, they look at the library's proposed budget, the historical society's proposed budget, um, um, Cambridge, you know, the equivalent of Cambridge works, uh, their economic development groups. They do not, uh, they do not look at the um, highway budget or the, you know, the, what I would consider your direct um, selectman's budget, you know, you know, your budgets for consultants and <coughs> the office staff and the operation of the office and things like that. It's mostly appropriations and committees uh, of, of the community. So those, the, those committees make their recommendation to a budget review committee rather than to you directly. Um, the budget review committee um, ultimately depending on what marching orders they're given by the select board um, at the outset of the budget process, um, they'll come back with a recommendation to you. Again, the committees, if they if they don't agree with the recommendation of the budget review committee, they have the right to come and make their pitch to you guys um, for you know, more or uh, less money, <coughs> probably not. Um, but uh, the reason I think it's a good idea is I think we've got some very good people in the community who are smart, um, who are, um, you know, connected to the business community, who have uh, talent, um, who are used to working with finances. And I think this would give an opportunity for you guys to get some additional community input into the budget process. It would give the citizens a little bit of investment in the budget process in their own taxes. Um, and at the end of the day, I think Cambridge's experience is that it makes the process of building in, in um, passing a budget uh, easier um, because they've got a group of, a budget advisory group who's actually going to town meeting and saying, we support this budget, um, and they intentionally try and get some, you know, fiscally conservative people on their budget review committee. So that's that's my pitch. I think there's a lot of value to it. I think there's a lot of talent in the community, and anytime we can use additional talent in a process like this, I don't think it's a bad thing. So we're a little bit behind the gun for this year. Yes, but yeah, absolutely, I get that. I'm not suggesting it for this year. I know the, the board has discussed it briefly, and uh, at the time we weren't sure if we wanted to do it or not. But I guess one thing we'd like to hear from people out here: Do you see value in that? I certainly come to meetings. <laughs> I see value in it, but I it's hard enough to get people to volunteer to do simple things. Yeah, it's not a simple thing. It's hard to find volunteers, but you never know. There's always pocket of people out there that like numbers and like doing that. I huh? You agree? <laughs> what? Wait a minute. What are the numbers of people on the site? Seven, seven, yeah, seven, In Cambridge. Yeah. Uh, I think they have. I think they have uh, <laughs> seven to nine, and typically closer to seven. But again, that's again that's something that the select board could could consider as they if they want to do it. 
The alternative to this is there is state statute that allows the citizens to petition to establish a budget, budget advisory committee. They're elected physicians. Um, I personally don't think that's the right way to go. I would much rather have it be on a, a committee appointed by the select board with, you know, with people being able to put their names in, you know, to be considered for the, for the committee. Um, but I, I'm not going to circulate a petition under the statute, which is an elected position. Um, if you're not interested in doing it, I would consider starting a petition um, asking the board to establish a, a budget advisory committee appointed, you know, with, with its members appointed by the board. I would much prefer that that impetus come from you. What? What is broken about the present process? Yeah. What's broken about it? Yeah. Um, well, having um, been a direct participant in the process for 15 years, uh, it's an enormous amount of work uh, for the guy that's sitting at the end of the table here now um, and the board. Um, what's broken about it also is it's, it's not necessarily broken. It's a question of are there good people that have got good ideas in the community who might be able to contribute uh, to the budget process and the finance process that you're not hearing from, that you don't get any input from? Um, I think that's the benefit to it. Uh, I think, you know, if you could get Walter Pomeroy um, on a budget review committee and have them propose a budget Again, not not all of the things that you're going to consider you know, your budget per se, but appropriations um, committees, um, boards, etc. It's a level of review that you guys wouldn't have to do because you'd essentially be getting a recommendation from the budget review committee. <coughs> Kim, just I'd like to hear Rosemary's take on this since you're the one who usually is dealing with all these numbers and. There's a lot of the budget. I think it's a great idea. I, th I would just say that if there's any fewer than five people on a committee, we're in dangerous ter territory talking about reviewing a whole bunch of different budget items. I'm also concerned when I hear specific people's names thrown out. It's awesome that some people are really strong in finances and ask really hard questions. I'm all about asking hard questions, but there's also personalities like mine often who are very strong personalities. And if there are few people in a board to review numbers like that, um, you put yourself at a risk of taking that person's opinion as opposed to a collective view. So if we're going, if the board is going to consider something of this nature, I would just caution that we make sure that a specific number of seats are filled during the review process and throughout and if we fall below that number it's off the board takes the responsibilities again um, well the board would have the ultimate <coughs> responsibility anyway they could accept or reject their recommendation of that. i understand Pleasure all of that but that person will if there are one or two people who are representing that review board and that's all the select board is hearing from, and they're not going through the same rigorous process that they would otherwise be doing. Yeah. Or, or maybe Brian is in that case because they're trusting what they're hearing as the advisory. Um, so it's just a caution. I understand what you're saying. Kim yeah. and then Jason. Well, I just was going to say if it, it, it could be done as a probationary, you know, if you're trying it out and you're not sure about it and it doesn't seem to be helpful or working for you, then you can. Disband it and just have that as yeah. Jason. I was just going to say, as a younger taxpayer, I would like to see like a voted on thing. This way, you don't get certain people in the board, like she was saying. You get a diversity of people that can sit down and get a common goal out of it, not be a bit one sided and get kind of bullied into a certain thing. By the way, I like the idea of it conceptually. I think it's a really good idea conceptually. But there just have to be safeguards in place. Would having a quorum um, be one of those safeguards? Maybe saying you can't even have a meeting unless there are four people present out of the seven or something. 
No, that's for a lot of water. Yeah. Not going to get any more. So, my concern is that uh, I think Annette was talking about this earlier when we, were, we had the discussion is that uh, money is connected to policy, and I don't necessarily want to deprecate policy decisions to uh, out there. Um, we had uh, tried to solicit involvement, I think, of people when we do the review for this year to, yep. you know, people to come in and when Brian was doing his numbers and did we get any, any people? I haven't had a uh, promoted open meeting yet, but I'm planning on those uh, after I get back in, in the next couple of weeks. But I mean, that's, I think a good way to kind of take the temperature of the room. If we pick out a date, uh, you know, we can say January 1st or January 2nd, um, in the evening, if I have a meeting where I'm going to come and run through the budget and show a draft in progress budget and work with people on it, are we going to have attendance? The last time when I've done this before, I haven't had attendance. I think that's a very different thing um, and a very different expectation than creating an advisory committee. Um, I, I think I don't think that would give you uh, uh, an accurate uh, reading of the interest. Uh, and to Jason's <coughs> point, I suggested in my email that if it's not something you're willing to do on your own, that I would request you to at least consider including an article at town meeting where the voters could talk about it um, and decide whether or not it was something they saw value in. I don't see a downside in that to you. You guys don't necessarily have to make a decision. <clears throat> you can include an article asking the voters what they think. And if the voters think it's a good idea, who are you to say no? If they think it's a bad idea, you're home free. Scott. Yeah, I'm surprised at the pushback on this idea. I think it's a great idea. Um, it's an advisory group. It's not binding. You're the elected officials. You make the call. And as far as somebody having an opinion on the advisory group, it's no different from a select board member having their opinion impacting that kind of work. So I'm not really clear on the pushback. I think it's a, a great idea. Um, and you don't know if things are going to work unless you try it. I'm hearing a lot of roadblocks thrown up. Um, and I'm just not clear why. Mr. Chairman? I'm, I'm uh, kind of miffed too and uh, kind of uh, surprised at the pushback to Scott. Um, I brought this forth uh, early summer. Uh, I talked to people in, in uh, uh, Jeff, Cambridge, uh, that were on it. Uh, it works very well for them. Initially, when I did bring it up, the board seemed to be on board. And the second time we talked about it, uh, then all these roadblocks come up. And uh, But if uh, Duncan would like to be the champion and it's his idea, let him have it. And if it goes forward, because I'm concerned about what is good for the town. And I think it's good to have a citizen participation on this board. And it brings more people into government to see what government is doing for our community. So I just see only a plus for it myself. But then again, I'm only one board member. Give it a try. If it doesn't work out for us, we can move on. But what hurt does it do to give it a try? Yeah, and I don't think there's any hurt in discussing what the possible, you know, downsides or roadblocks should be. I think this is a healthy discussion. I don't. I actually don't think that we're throwing roadblocks. I think we're just discussing. Um, yeah, the pros and cons. I mean, we've always done the budget a certain way so for myself I'm just trying to logistically figure it out in my head how this is all gonna work you know um, and I also have some concern that you know we study that budget so many times and then to sort of take big pieces out and then not be studying them and then then having the advisory board sort of tell us how we should be I, I don't know I'm just trying to figure out in my head how that how all those pieces would come together because ultimately we would then
present this budget to the, to, uh, you know, we're responsible for it. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we'd be um, feeling as comfortable with it as we normally are. Duncan or Mike speak to how it works in the other towns, um, the process by which you guys form the budget and then it gets passed off and then passed back, or what? how does that work? There's a long drawn out, you've uh, seen it and you pass it on to the board about how this whole process works. I mean, I'm not into the weeds by any means. Uh, all I know is that they say it works good for them they get people to speak to the budget at town meeting, regular folks that are sitting right in the audience to get up and speak to it. And it works so much better, you know? And I do disagree with the roadblocks. I mean, it was dead in the water after our second discussion. And it's only after Duncan brought it up that we're actually discussing it again. Because if it hadn't been for him, we wouldn't be talking about it right now. In, in Cambridge, um, the committee, again, is appointed by the select board. The select board, I think I sent a resolution. That's what I was talking about. Cambridge, out what they actually asked the board to look at. That's the piece that I think you got. And you could start very, very small. You know, you could say you want the budget advisory committee to review, you know, three areas of the budget. Um, you know, whatever, whatever, I think that's the piece where you guys can apply some of your um, concern about, you know, loss of control over the budget, um, et cetera. But basically in, in Cambridge, it's the budget review committee is appointed by the board. They get marching orders from the board. Um, for example, they may, the board may say, we want to see all of the budgets coming in at no more than a percent and a half increase. Um, or two percent, whatever that you know, whatever that number might be, or they may give them no marching orders at all. It, you know, it really depends on what the board decides. Um, but that budget review committee receives the the proposed budgets from, for example, the historical society. Instead of presenting a budget and submitting it to, to Brian, uh, and Brian puts it rolls it into your budget, and you guys look at our budget, we would go to the budget advisory committee make a pitch to the budget advisory committee and then it would go into the budget and then you guys would get your look at it again so it's really not a lot different for your perspective sitting on the board instead of having us give it to brian and have brian put it in the budget it would be us give our presentation to the budget review committee gets put into you know for your consideration you get to review it and make the final decision. I can think of hundreds of times when as a former town administrator, I would draft a proposal for you guys sitting up there and you five people would look at it and you'd say, well, what about this? You know, maybe we, I never thought of it. <clears throat> well, what about this? Oh, I never thought of it. What a, the end result was a better product because there were more people involved in thinking through the process. That's what I think the value of potentially of having a budget advisory committee could be. It's having more people with varied experience um, who may be able to, you know, point you in directions you haven't thought about before. So we don't need to uh, figure out the details tonight. I guess what no. we need to decide is the concept. Do we want to have a budget committee? If we're not interested, then we have, we're allowing Duncan the opportunity to get a petition and have it as an article before the vote. Or you could you could make it an article yourself. Or we could make it an article ourselves. Let's say we don't want to make the decision, but we're willing to you know, let the voters decide. Or you could make a motion to just pass it to me. <laughs> So I'm looking for some guidance from the board because we sort of have to make a decision tonight, at least so that Duncan can raise a petition if we express no no interest in it. Eric? Since everybody's just thinking, I just thought of a group that hasn't... I put him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> that's my job. <laughs> a group that hasn't, I don't think, been mentioned in this discussion, and that's the volunteer groups, all of whom have to do budgets. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm quite sure that they come in in all different forms. And having a committee that 
the various groups could work with could probably be very helpful for everyone. <clears throat> If they're going to take some of that responsibility, I totally agree. I did budget for rec, I can't tell you how many times. And yeah, that would be a huge help to the volunteers, but then we have to have the volunteers to help the volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm thinking about the people, the people who are going to be willing to serve on this. The one thing is a targeted activity, it doesn't go on. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Go all over the place and start. Yeah. So I think it's great. Yeah, sometimes you can't put them in. It really can help people focus. Yeah, so your, dead, your deadlines intact are going to be what's. You need time to make a decision. So. Yeah, and it's limited. I mean, Salt. you know, the Cambridge thing, they probably meet four or five times right. total. Mm -hmm. But you guys need that, you know. This process can't slow down what you guys have to do. That's right. No, yeah, we have real hard stuff. You gotta get it done. Yeah, good one. So sometimes when you get too many people trying to figure stuff out, it yeah. takes a lot longer. So who but if you if you get your deadlines down tight and say, Well, this is it, guys. If you don't have it, we're gonna do it. Yep. Then it might, be, it might work. So obviously we do not have time to put something together for this year. If we, in concept, agreed with it, it would be something we would have until next year to establish. And Brian's story would sort of oversee the, if, I mean, who would, who's going to manage? The well, we would provide marching orders, I guess, from the way Cambridge does it, anyhow. <laughs> this year, for example, I talked to George Putnam. This year, they gave them no marching orders whatsoever. You know, they said, review the budgets, we'll see what comes in. Okay. Cambridge is also figuring out how their budget advisory committee interacts with their administrators. They haven't had an administrator. Right. They, they, never had one. they have never had one. They have done this since 1974. So it's, you know, it's not, it's not a, uh, exactly a, you know, a wing in kind of approach. Mr. Chairman? But nor is uh, our system. Nat, for what's that? I'm sorry. So um, my concern with this. No, I built the process. I know oh, I'm sorry. Like <laughs> no, I've been recognized. So um, my concern with this in the last time that this came up um, was that we're going to delegate sort of something I see as a core select board responsibility of deciding our priorities to this other body that they're going to study it, come back to us. And we have strong feelings that it should be a different way than, or that we don't take the recommendations, that um, that can make volunteers on a committee feel like they, they're wasting their time pretty quickly because I'm just overruling them or the select board perhaps is overruling them. Um, I, I wouldn't want the select board to have any less overview. You talked about this being a, um, a significant amount of work for the select board. I think that's work that we should continue to do regardless. So I don't think it should lessen our amount of review or, or lighten our load at all. Um, so that's that's the concern that I that I have. Um, having said that, there's a great deal of interest in people serving on the committee are aware that um, there's there's another review level of oversight before. Um, before this goes to uh, town meeting, hoping to investigating and, and uh, seeing what the options are. Dope. I'm thinking about how you'd integrate this committee with Brian. I, if we had a committee, I would want them to just like we give. Brian, you know, throughout the year, we got to carry this forward. We got to think about that. We have to incorporate this thing into our budget. I think that they should report to Brian, and Brian would go through the budget just like we did the rest of the time. You know, I, I see the the phase in being them putting the information into Brian's story and not bringing it up to us because uh, oh. uh, that's an I don't. I really have a problem when we have a committee and I don't like turning down our committees and you know for, for the reason that you were talking about mm -hmm. uh, 
I like to respect what they do, and if I'm not studying that, then I'm not able to to think about that, you know, or, or to evaluate it. And so I would like it to go to Brian, who would be part of the evaluation for us, and could tell us that this is what the committee thought, this is what he did, what he thinks in light of what we said before. You know, I would like it to be rationalized at that level before it comes to us. I like that idea. Mike? I'm with the town of Johnson uh, form the budget advisory committee. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? No. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second? I think we need to continue. Yeah. We need to continue working. It's much too vague for me to sign on to. Um, we need to continue working on the structure of it. Number of members. Well, I guess what it's going to be. You can work on the structure after you. Uh, motion dies at lack of second, but in, I think what we need to provide to Duncan tonight is in concept. Right. Am I hearing a board that's interested in forming? Not going into the details tonight, but in concept. My, my interest is, is pretty simple. If, if the board has absolutely no interest in it, then I would consider taking a petition out to have it become an article in your morning will the town ask its select board to establish a budget advisory committee that in and of itself is going to be an advisory vote you could decide you didn't want to honor that vote i think that would be a big mistake not to if we've got the petition and you know, the majority of the people voted on an article in town meeting. But that would be your decision. Um, if you're not interested in doing a budget advisory, which apparently you're not, would you at least consider putting an article out well, on that's your own versus having me get a petition for it? You just said apparently we're not, which is totally contrary to. Well, Mike just made a motion. Yeah, so so I like it. It. His motion died. His, that he didn't motion. incorporate any of the, the the review, the integration into yeah. our system I that, made that I would have proposed. Well, I think that's, I mean, I, I think yeah. the concept is do you want to consider a budget advisory committee that we need? I, I'm not asking you to decide what you right. want that budget advisory committee to do tonight. That That's a long term process, as Nat points out something that needs to be discussed over a number of work sessions, et cetera. That's, to me, that's the weeds. The concept is, would you consider it? Um, if you would consider it, then, then you've got many, many work sessions probably to figure out what it looks like. Right, but that, that's what I said before, is I would consider it, which yeah. is different than I'm gonna vote up or down on this very vague okay. thing that's completely undefined. Yeah. Is it your resolution? So yes, we would consider it. I would consider it. That's my opinion. So by uh, consensus, am I hearing a in concept? In concept, one, two. You heard what I said. Yeah, I know. <laughs> of course. Okay. So I think in concept there is agreement. We would look into it and uh, try to figure out how it would work, Scott. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really clear on the definition of. We'll consider it. What that mean? What that exactly means? You know, we're we're in concept of having one. It's right. just we don't know how it's going to look yet. Right. I think what I'm looking for is more than just that comment that you actually have a date that you decide that something is going to occur because of the date is just pushed back because of the amount of work that it may take. I think you owe Duncan a very clear path moving forward. With he's not comfortable and some of the members in this audience aren't comfortable that the paperwork be submitted and we get it on the ballot and let the voters take it from there. I'm looking for a date because I, I hear considered maybe it could a be, lot. Maybe it could be warned or happen and, and that you can provide a warning for it if you can't provide the well, we we're, we're too far behind the eight ball to do it this year. The in concept was to form a committee. It would be for next year. It's only in concept, so uh, any date I put out there would be in concept only. Uh, it's something we would work on for next year. 
in, in, in fairness, uh, whether my petition or whether you put it on the, on the articles on your own volition. I think there's value to having a town-wide discussion, and I would encourage you to think about putting it in as an article. The reality is it's going to be an advisory vote. Right. You know, we, I can't structure a petition that requires you to appoint a budget advisory committee any more than you can, you know, it's an advisory vote. What I think the value of that is, is having the discussion at town meeting. People get to talk about the pluses and minuses, and if people don't want it, great. If people think it's a great idea, um, then, you know, I think you would be ill-advised not to proceed. Um, but at the end of the day, it's advisory. You don't have to. Scott? Yeah, just a follow-up question. Duncan, when would you need some kind of clarification to determine whether you have to put a petition in? I'm not sure of the time frame on that. January 23rd. No, before that. Before it's the middle of January. So yeah. that time frame is coming right around. Yeah. I think it's a fair question. I think, it needs to be I think it's a fair question, too, because if we sat on our hands and didn't do a thing, it would be beyond the point of no return and it couldn't be put on the ballot anyway. It could be put on the petition for town meeting anyway. So that would be just pushed down, down the road another year. So I'd like to stick right by my original motion that we form a budget advisory committee for the town of Johnson and then to then work out the details. Is that a motion again? It is. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Motion dies lacking a second. Jason. <clears throat> the only question I have about this is maybe I'm not taking a different way than the rest of you. You guys are under a concept that you're gonna look into it after you get some members and how you're gonna make the members work with him. I took it at what you guys are looking to get and figure out how it's gonna work. You guys aren't saying no, you're just trying to put something together to see how you're gonna make it work. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't say no to it, you just trying to figure it out. Because yeah. you said Cambridge doesn't have didn't have an administrator working with it, right? So yeah. we're two different things right now. That's why I, I get it. But <laughs> Cambridge fine. Cambridge just passed a new resolution <clears throat> reauthorizing the board. They've had a, a town administrator for less than a year. I helped them find them. Um, so yes, it's a work in progress to figure out how that's gonna work. But it's it's happening. They still see a lot of value of having the budget Kim? Could the motion just be that it will be warned? We will warn it, and that way it's it, it, it will be discussed, and if it gets knocked down, and then you still you, you will take the result of that that warning at a meeting and move forward with it positively or not. We would not warn. To to uh, have an article in the warning uh, or vote on it. I would personally support an article that goes before the voters, but that'll be a decision the board makes when, if we do it on our own, when we develop our warning. So you can't make a motion this evening that it will be an article? In no, I, I could look for consensus among the board members, and I will do that if there was consensus to put it before the voters. On town meeting day, sure. on our own. In in the email in to you, I had draft language for what an article. But <clears throat> you'd support? Well, of course, I would support it. I mean, I think that uh, the, the last motion I made was to have a budget advisory committee for the town of Johnson and to work out the details. So, in other words, that died of a lack of a second. So, I mean, good grief. Of course, I would support that and bring it to the voters. Let them decide. So, I would work out the details and then <laughs> go with the uh, budget advisory committee. I'm, I'm sensing there is a majority that would put it as an article. Shane? If there isn't a motion put forward tonight, is there anything binding you to that course of action? There is nothing binding this board. We could undo anything we did. <laughs> Well, what I'm, <clears throat> to reiterate what I think I've heard from that, Duncan is looking for a course of action. Yeah. And leaving this meeting, he's either being told to go out and start getting petition signatures or that the board 
is going to take care of it. And if he's told the board is going to take care of it and decides not to get petition signatures, and then the middle of January rolls around and the board hasn't taken care of it and there's no time for get petition signatures, we're waiting until next year. So, in the, like, as someone who wants to see something like this happen, but is also interested in seeing the details worked out, I think we all want to know what the next step is. And I was unable to get any commitment from the board. <laughs> it's, but it's in a, concept, they agreed. It's a trust us thing. Yeah. We're not a deadline. <laughs> you know, the goal would be to get it in place by next year so they can do it for the budget, but to define it would not be. Uh, we will create this thing, and then we have to figure out what it is. And, and, and again, I go back to the even if I even if I circulate a petition, the petition is going to be advisable mm -hmm. on units. I think again, I think you would be foolish not to follow the opinion of the voters if the article is passed. Um, but you know, that would be your prerogative to, to say we're not going to do it. You know, it's just the same deal with the form based code for Grand Hell that it was two to one. And the rest of the board jumped on board with that. And if you voted against a two to one majority uh, in the town, uh, they're always talking about uh, the kiss of death or the political death or something. Uh, of course, uh, the, the town should support the, the decision of the voters. Period. So, so I guess I, 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 I don't see the disadvantage of having the board on its own volition include an article in the morning asking the voters to advise you on whether or not to establish a budget advisory committee. So move. To me, that seems like kind of a no-brainer. And I did sense a majority that would support that article. Well, I didn't hear I'll make a motion in here. And then I'll make a motion, and then it will be on the record. Okay, we have a motion to include that as an article on this year's warning. What's the article? Tell me exactly what the article is, please. Do you have the article? Uh, the one you got an email from. Don't yes. I can read you what I suggested, which was: Shall the selectmen appoint a budget advisory committee? of resident taxpayers of the town of Johnson as a finance committee for the purpose of initial re review and evaluation of budget requests of departments, committees, boards, and organizations connected to the town of Johnson budget and to recommend their findings to the members of the Johnson Select Board who shall have the final decision over those proposed budgets. Now, those committees and boards that you would be, that would be the process that you decide. Can I, can I see it, please? That kind of makes it sound like it's all committees. Yes. But I think that's, that, that was just a suggestion. You guys could tweak that motion any way you want. I mean, you could, you could say uh, such committees as the board <laughs> deems appropriate. If I can offer a comment, the change is select people, select, select board persons, board. select board. Um, board not select we're board. going to have a meeting where we set the warning, and all articles are warning. That would be a time where the board could be held accountable if they don't follow through on this. Well, I wouldn't have time to. to you wouldn't have, have time, time, but it would be the board is making a commitment. <coughs> You know, that's not making a commitment, but there's general interest in the board to do it. Uh, you're right that it lacks time to circulate a petition, but you can raise any issue from the floor. You can circulate a petition and not submit it. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. Yeah. just do it as a safeguard. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's... You know, I, I think this, the, the time you hold the board accountable is when they are writing the warning. That's all. They either do add it or they don't. Mike has got a motion on the floor to add that article as indicated from Duncan. Is there a second? If you make it gender neutral, and the first sentence of the select board members, yes, we'll make it the second. Okay, we have motion and second to add in concept the article uh, that Duncan's presented as a warning item. Is there any more discussion? Does this, does this say that we, it sounded like, and it's, 
comment that uh, Linda said that it sounds like you have to present it to all departments. Of can we do select portions of it, which is indicating that what you does that say we can pick and choose? Well, it, it, it does not, but I would suggest that that the that the article be worded that way at the board's okay. discretion, right at the very end. Yes, that would do it. Yes, it's my my take on that is that it's an advisory vote in that. Um, the, the the form of the finance committee is going to be, if it's ultimately decided by the board, will be decided by the board. Yeah. The form? You mean tasks? What's delegated to them? Yeah. Scott? Yeah, besides the gender neutral comment um, change, I'm not sure who put this out because it seems like it was a couple of years ago now. There was a comment made that the advisory panel would report to Brian and not the select board because of something. I missed it. I'm not really clear on who said that. That was, that was you. So if it would appease Doug just to have those recommendations go back to Brian and then he can bring them back to the select board. And I think that would take care of your concern. Mm -hmm. I have no issue with that. At the end of the day, Brian works for you. Uh, so whether they whether they whether the committee submits to Brian and then he submits to you, um, and really is immaterial. We're getting way into the weeds. Yeah. Well, that's the nature. You know, when we get back and we say, "Well, what's our warning? What did we say before?" It matters what you said before. It does, and I, I totally believe that you guys should be prepared. To have a proposal, if if you're willing to have this go for a vote, you should be prepared to stand up just like you do on any other article and say, "Yes, we think it's a good idea." No, we think it's a really crappy idea. If we think it's a good idea, this is what we would like to see. And again, it's advisory. Um, I cannot word an article that binds you to do this. At the end of the day, you can say we don't want to do that. It's a bad idea. I I would actually say that we put things on the warning frequently that we don't take a, a position on one way or the other. Sometimes we do. We might on this one. Well, if it's an article that you're putting in on your own relation, you better have a position. <laughs> I think it would be reasonable. Yeah. It would just be so much simpler if the board would just approve it tonight. The concept that we're going to do it. Well, I would. I would vote in favor of it if it uh, speaks to the concern, to what Scott indicated my concern with previously, who we report to, and the discretion. We have a motion. So, so yeah, we've already got a motion. I second. understand that. Can we, can we amend the motion to reflect the two changes and call the I would do that if we could have a vote tonight and just do away with the petition or do away with the article on town meeting and decide it tonight and move forward. If you uh, kill the article, you probably kill the concept. <laughs> here's, the, here's the thing. Well, I made a second to this. This is a concept. It's very general. It doesn't include those sorts of specifics. I think as we get into the weeds, we'll need to address those sorts of things. But right now, let's keep it very general. See what the people say on town meeting day. And go from there. And, and Brian is right. You, you guys still have the ability to wordsmith the article. Right up until the time that you sign the dotted line on it. We do, but I, I mean, I don't know the more if we need to revisit this. Okay. This horse is down and dead. Do we want to keep beating it or are we ready to take a vote? All those in favor, see if I'm saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. And the chair votes in favor. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, Collective bargain? Yes. Um, we want to do the uh, communications with our attorney first. <coughs> uh, okay. Mike, I gave you the bold language there. Who wants to make the motion? <coughs> Executive session for communications with our attorney. I move to find the premature general public knowledge regarding communication with our attorney regarding the possible formation of a union by town employees 
would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage because the select board risks disclosing privileged communications. I move that we enter into executive session to discuss attorney-client communication under the privileged, excuse me, provisions of Title I, Section 313A1. Could I ask that you also include inviting Rosemary, Brian Krause, and uh, Brian Story? Yes, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion on the floor entering into executive session. We have a second. We normally do, but we've got a couple items on the agenda that we need to have this discussion first. We have relevant information from our attorney that the board needs to be aware of. And that this is. So I have a motion to enter into executive session. Do we have a second? <coughs> second. Any discussion? Hey, Jason. You drop it right there. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And show us an executive session at 9 35. Okay, show us out of executive session at 10 o'clock. Uh, do we have a uh, motion on a collective bargaining letter? Let me see. So I move to acknowledge receipt of petition for collective bargaining representation for the Highway and Public Works Department and request a consent election. Do we have a motion on the floor? Do we have a second? I'll second, second that. Right. A motion is second. Do you have any discussion? Take going? The tape going? Yes. Okay. <laughs> any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And you'll follow up with that, right, yep. Brian? Okay. Town uh, employee. Do you guys know what we got? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Uh, town employee compensation rates for 2020. Okay. And we had, when we met with the trustees, you provided us with some scenarios. Yeah, I just have a couple scenarios here based on prior discussions um, <clears throat> for adjustments of two and 3% uh, to office and highway employees. Uh, Rosemary, did the village talk about this for you at their last meeting or? No. No, okay. Uh, yeah, because you and Jen are our last remaining joint positions. But we're gonna be paying separately. Well. Because there is no more. complications with that. Oh, is there? Retirement. Oh, you gotta be one or the other. How did we do it with Jan and Susan? I mean, uh, Ann and Susan. One paycheck. One paycheck. Can we issue one paycheck with two different rates if we come up? Yes. Okay. So if we come up with a different rate than what the village has, we're not. So you can still cut one check? Yes. Okay. We're not messing with your retirement or obligating the village to something. And if I remember correctly, with the increases in the health care costs for the employees to basically stay whole, it was about 2%? About 2% is uh, remaining whole. Cool. What was the impact to the town if we, you know, 2% increase on employees' compensation? How much do our costs increase? I'm sorry, I don't have my computer in front of me. Um, the Well, 
We budgeted three percent. We budgeted three percent. But we did not budget for an increase in healthcare costs mid year. Not an increase of this size. How much did we? Uh, I, th I, if I remember right, our estimated healthcare increase was six percent. And this is double, double that. Double that. Well, um, fifteen point three. Yeah. Almost triple. Yeah. Should you get your computer? I think I should. You can hold on okay. just a minute. This is, this is for our 20, 20, 20, 20 budget. It, it, start January 1st. it starts January 1st. Remember, we budgeted to where we start giving increases in January to match when they're increased health insurance. And so we went to that schedule. We moved in what we did. Somehow we did it with the town employees moving up from July 3rd to January 1st. Right. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Yes. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Yes. Um, I just wonder if, if would you increase the funding to support the health care? That's not considered an increase in their compensation? It's an increase in their total package, yeah. Their benefits and salary, yeah. So this, what you're talking about is pay increase, it's at 2% above and beyond what you've already increased it to cover their 91% match on healthcare. Yeah. No? No? No. Well, if, if you look at the total compensation, the 70,000 range, that includes benefits and salary. Right? What portion of health care do they pay? Uh, it's a 91.9% divide. So that's a lot less than what school, what teachers pay, right? Won't they pay 15? Twenty-five percent. I, I don't know. State workers pay twenty-five percent. Yeah. But that's is that already a done deal? That that you passed the ninety that you were going to pay the ninety-one. Yeah. Okay. And it, did it get calculated what percent increase over what it already was? Do you know what I mean? That that was an increase. That percent can't work out on how much more you're paying to compensate them for the healthcare. Uh, does this show our increase in our insurance that we pay? Yes, it does. Okay. It shows all 2020. The top, the top area is the current. And so, um, below the line is 2020. Yeah. Yeah, it's just not working out percent. So it looks like. Uh, am, I, am I reading this correctly? It's about a $200 increase in their insurance. That'd be per employee. To kind of answer your question, when you said 20. It's a twenty-five hundred dollar increase average health care, uh, so that's a dollar twenty an hour. And so then, if you put a two percent, a forty cent on top of that, it's actually a dollar sixty. That's what really, you know, yeah. give or take a few cents. Yeah. But but so nowhere in the paper that I'm looking at does it show a flat. You know, like the we already gave you an increase on your health care. But now we want to give you another increase, and it doesn't show what it would look like just to have it, that be the increase to get the. the well, uh, I mean, I'll wait for Brian to come back to answer this exactly, but I believe the annual insurance is $16,181. That went up to $18,662. Of that, those are family plans. Those are family plans for two person plans. Oh, I was gonna okay. say, that's not a thousand person. Yeah. I, so I guess where I'm, I'm still lost too is what portion of that is the towns and what portion is 
Is this the the thirteen hundred? Is that the uh, employees' contribution? And it's going up to fifteen hundred. And we're the balance. Possibly. Okay, I guess we'll have to wait for Brian on that. But. I thought the family plan was. Uh, when I'm thinking back to when we were hiring a recreation person, and the family plan for sure. her was like twenty some odd thousand. Mm -hmm. That was the whole rated. Two person. Yeah. Okay, these are average office and highway annual insurance. Yes. So that's uh, ones that have single insurance and ones that have family, and it's the average of. Yes. Okay. They currently, on average. Or excuse pay, me, the, the pay is average, the insurance is two percent insurance, which is the average plan. Okay, I'm, I'm losing you now. 2%? Rather than choosing an amalgam of all the plans that we have, yeah. the numbers on the spreadsheet that you have in front of you is the average actual plan. So it's the average of everybody, all, the whole pool, all put together. Right. The most of our people use the two-person plan. No, it's so a choice of plan rather than amalgamating the premiums. Right. It, it's... What is it? It's the mean. And if you remember mean, median, mode, it's the yeah. one that occurs most often. So <coughs> most of our people, uh, that's retirement, that's Social Security, that's um, dental. Dental, thank you. It, it's everything else that we pay besides health insurance and that. So it's all of the expenses related to an employee that aren't uh, health insurance or wages. So I guess how much will this increase our costs? So what is the total increase for the town on the insurance cost? That, that's what I'm, I'm not seeing here. Okay, the total increase to the town on the insurance, I'll give you in two parts. So we have highway insurance and town insurance split out. Okay. All right, the new highway insurance this public works insurance. Yeah. Public works insurance, thank you. <coughs> we'll go up by roughly eight thousand five hundred dollars. So that's the total amount. That's a total amount. 8,000, what was it? $8,453.22. Okay. And then how much on the town, which would, the office? The office staff. You're going to be 2x that, Scott, you know. In the village side, you're going to be 2x that. that yeah, we're going to have a discussion on all this, which would be interesting.
about. All right, including this get the office staff gets a little bit different because we didn't have uh, Lisa, our rec coordinator, in it last year. Okay. But our insurance will go up by about fifteen thousand. <coughs> okay, so. That's added. That's the increase and leases insurance. It, I'm seeing, you know, a little over twenty three thousand increase. What did we budget? You think that's too high? Currently, Lisa's doing in lieu of. She's doing it in lieu of, isn't she? You're right. Uh, let me cut that. She's got a light. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I've got it down to 8,700. Okay. So we're about 17,000 increase total. How much did we budget for in for an increase in January? Don't you said 6%? So about half Maybe. of that. We've got a couple of seconds so I can. So just to clarify for Eric, when he's crunching these numbers, this is the total cost. This is the combined cost of the town and the employee putting in the money to pay these bills to 8,453 and 8,700. This is the town's contribution. Town's contribution. Okay. Uh, I believe that's what we were asking right. for in this case was, what does it cost the town? Not. I mean, we'll probably want to next get to how much each employee, well, it's hard to say with employee because it depends on their plans. But wouldn't one reflect the cost of the percent? Won't that be reflected in all of them? If the increases come yeah. up? Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, we, Mike's closer to right, it is going to be three times. Uh, we had a 5% increase, not 6%. Okay. So we budgeted for around 5,000? An increase of, yeah. Is that- Well, actually, <coughs> again, Lisa wasn't included at that time, so it's a little bit less, but yeah, around 5,000. 5,000 as of January? And as so of January. And so this 17,000 actually comes down to uh, 8,500. Because that's 17,000. Yeah, that's 17,000 uh, when I calculated. It's for a year. It's for a year. So that comes down to 8,500. We budgeted about 5,000. So we're short 3,500 in our budget. Yes. Okay. No, no, that's total for the town. Yeah, that we should break even. But that's without a raise. That's, that's just not the, looking at a raise at all. Yet. Yeah, this is just the uh, the health care. So we budgeted 3% for a pay increase, correct? Let me double check it just to avoid. That was a little on the generous side. Uh, it was supposed to be. I mean, that was supposed to be, that was supposed to give us a cushion. Right. Um, well, I guess where I'm going at with this is with a cushion we budgeted for a pay increase and what we went over on our health insurance, we may be able to at least uh, keep a level funded budget, not have to uh, pay out more than we had line item for. 
And yeah, we did estimate a 3% increase. 3%. And it would have been from January 1st on. Yep. And you know how much that money is? Uh, 3% for all employees was uh, about $4,000. 60 cents. $4,000 for six months. Give me a second uh, to make sure it's for six months. Uh, more like 3000 for six months. Well, you brought it down to 60 cents an hour last meeting for, for uh, average. Yeah, it would average, it would uh, the. You know, the average impact for an employee would have been about 60 cents an hour. Right. But again, that's using the average employee for all employee, all office employees. It's about. 3,000 for six months and for all highway employees. Public works employees. Public works employees, thank you. Uh, it would be closer to 2,000. For six months or a year? For six months. And then you gave us 40 cents for 2% two, 2 last meeting. So that's a total of 5,000. If you subtract the increase of the health care, 3,500, it leaves us with 1,500 that we budgeted for. That we're overspending. No, that's no, actually what we have without giving any pay raises. So you're looking at a 1% pay raise. Yeah, about 1% or 1.5%. Okay. And you'd be about zeroed out on what we budgeted. Yeah, Eric, I appreciate your work on this and your math and whatnot. Um, I just wanted to bring up again uh, that Social Security for this year uh, is looking at a cost of living increase for 1.6%. And these are the people who actually pay the employees' salaries. And the rest of the cost of living increase for workers, it's a little bit splintered out. I came up with 1.7. I think that's a tad low for what's being projected. Um, and again, these are the residents who are paying the salaries of the town employees, high taxes in Vermont, uh, as well as Johnson, seem to keep bringing up. We have a lot of big walls. We can't keep on throwing this kind of compensation packages at everybody because it's not sustainable. I mean, I, I think you're going to have, in its predict, uh, prediction, you're going to have the wealthy who can afford to live here, and you're going to have, you know, the other side that actually may have some kind of social income coming in to help pay those bills. But the middle of the people who are trying to keep out living in this community are really going to have to do some homework and figure if they can still afford to live in this community. And, you know, we've come to a point where we really have to take, take action. And, you know, sometimes action is not fun. Um, I've worked for state government in the past, and we've actually had 4% cuts uh, and no pay increases for an expanded amount of time under the Douglas administration. And we have paid our fair share of you know, health care. Um, you know, we used to pay 25%, still do under retirement. It's the reality, and I think Kim and I were really blessed with that kind of compensation. Um, but it just seems like things are getting confusing um, for people who are residing in the community to keep on seeing these two and three percent increases. And the ratio, you know, roughly 90-10 um, for healthcare insurance. In a perfect world, we would be able to compensate everybody for full health insurance, but that would be for everybody, not just for public service. And, you know, I, I really hope 
that you hear what I have to say because I think it's important to the community members who pay their taxes, especially the ones who are trying to pay them on time. I think you're going to have trouble at town meeting. I think you're going to have serious trouble at town meeting. They're going to cut your budget again, and it's going to, I think it's going to come down to the health care thing. You know, they're going to look at all these other, not just, um, the teachers and the state, but other communities where they don't have this good of benefit package. I think our town employees and village employees have been pretty good. They might work hard, and I agree. They, I appreciate what they do, but we all want to raise. I can't raise my rates because I won't have work. People won't hire me. They can't afford to do it if I raise my rates. And I think it comes to a point where, I agree with Scott, it's going to come to a point where your town meeting is not going to be fun. Is the, if I ask you a question, oh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, looking at the uh, current average uh, the public works department take home, pre tax take home is 48000 Is that inappropriate for what they're what they I think their benefit package is just far more than what the. I got, no, that's their take home. Yeah. That doesn't include their insurance. Right. Well, that I doesn't just include their health care. You know, and I agree that's not unreasonable, but a lot of people make a heck of a lot less money than that. You know, and have to pay for their health care out of their pocket. You know, it's. Do you guys use studies when you're looking at the salary uh, rates? Every couple of years, we get a the uh, salary study from the League of Cities and Towns on comparable sized towns, some you know, same jobs, what they're paying. So we we've always been trying to be at uh, competitive at or just above the average. So what I what we've seen for a number of these, we talked to the sheriff's department, and one or two others recently, of their paying less for health insurance. A number of them are paying a portion of their employees' deductibles. So they're paying less for health insurance, but then they're setting aside an additional amount. Uh, they're, they're paying 75% of premiums, but then they're setting aside an additional amount. We don't pay anything for deductibles. Uh, we like that because it's relatively predictable. Uh, but it's, some years it's definitely costing us more than the other way. We could get lucky, we could, you know, come out ahead going the other direction. That's something that we definitely want to consider. Scott. Yeah, so Doug, you bring up a good point that the compensation is fair enough. Um, before the last joint meeting we had, I did send an email out um, based on census information on average salaries in the town of Johnson and then breaking them out um, based on gender, which was a little sad to see the differences between um, men and women. But I don't have the document with me, but it was like the twenty, thirty thousand dollar, maybe even lower, depending on the, the age group and what gender they were. So when we have average salaries in this community that are almost half of what our town workers are getting, it's still a really big push. And you know, I keep talking about what's sustainable for this community before you have people charging for the borders. You, you know, it's time to sort of have a, a real candid conversation with the people who are funding this town and the village included. I mean, the village is no better. There's work to be to be had on the village trustees part. <coughs> and employees squabble, you know, they complain a lot, so you hear them over and over and over and over and over and over. And after a while, that does, you know, but on the other side of it. Oh, we, we hear both sides. Oh, yeah. We have the taxpayers that come in crying because yeah. they can't pay their taxes. And, yeah. You know, you know like we do the, uh, the salary studies for people doing the same job in the same size communities, and we try to be you know, competitive, but um, we have to pay them the going rate for that job or we'll yeah. lose them. It's kind of a reason that people want, I mean, people really do want to work for the town. Yeah, there are so some you don't have a, you, yeah. you guys never have trouble finding help. Never used to. That's becoming 
more of a problem. Well, now they got that with the CDL, but yeah, but they're trained. But people want to work for the town, and they're they want to come because they know they have a good benefit package. They know their compensation is up there. When I first got on the select board, and I hear everything you guys are saying because everybody's property taxes are way too high. When I very first got on the select board, they used to, the select board sat around and we would decide uh, we can't go for the grader this year because the school has got an increase of by 10, 15 percent. And, and when every year the school was having the same kind of increases, we finally said we can't go by the school, we had to do what's best for the town. And so we stopped looking at the school. And the problem is, I mean, we're the face of the community. We're the ones that taxpayers look at, but three quarters of their tax bill is the school. And yet we can't make up that difference. I mean, they have- Because teachers pay more of their health care. The teachers yeah. pay a bigger portion of their health But I mean, their salaries I are- I agree. They yeah. Significantly more than what these. Yeah, I did look at it. I was on the school yeah. board, and it was again, it was the same thing. You have to raise their base pay in order to get them to stay here because they right. work and get experience, then they go to Chittenden County. You know, they work here five years and they get experience and they go. Yeah. You know, so the, they were in the same boat, so you had to get the salaries. I mean, even a, if we did level funding on the town, we couldn't even come close to keeping everybody's taxes low because the school increase is so much more than what we even play with. I, I understand, I hear you, it's frustrating, but... Yeah. Um, well, more people have to go to the school board at the budget meetings. Yeah. Okay, so back to... Uh, yeah. What we're talking about for compensation. A one and a half percent probably is pretty close to being in line with what we budgeted. Yep. With the insurance increase. Where does the board want to go with that? Anything over one and a half, we're over our budget. When we have uncontrollable expenses for health insurance and it, it's financial death to for people not to have medical insurance for people who don't you know but it, it's it's like you know, you know what in your other pocket if you don't have insurance you might as well have a payment for a bankruptcy attorney you know, for medical expenses i i you know this is the looking at our taxpayers and looking at our employees this you know we're we're like the college battling nvu for money you know this is the system is it's, it's a complete inadequacy of uh of a medical program on the national level that's pushed down to the people less able to to handle this i don't know what to do with this it, it's uh, <clears throat> I don't think our people take home too much money. I think that their insurance is uh, uh, percentage what we compensate them at ninety. Our payment is, is high, especially compared to as gradually teachers have been driven down and stuff. But on the other hand, you know it's hard to change the budget of these people what they're living on, and yet you have the other. I don't do this. It, it's you know, somebody else. Who's, who's got the great answer? Well, the, the discussion tonight is on salary alone. Yep. Mm -hmm. Salary alone. We aren't talking about. I mean, uh, not that the two aren't related and, and one is relevant to the other. But well, it's relevant to the argument of what can people afford? Absolutely. Absolutely. I just want to clarify what we're. Yeah. What we need to decide. And last year we did 2%. Or do we two point five? Yes, two point five. Don't remember. I don't. One year we did one percent. I don't think it was three. It was not three. Uh, we when we came down to compromise with the village, I think it was two point five. Let 
health increase means that we're going to have is uh, certainly, certainly a factor here. What are your thoughts, Mike? I fell asleep. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I'm wide awake. One year we did 1%. Yeah. And actually, you know, if you think about it, with that huge increase uh, in their health care. Uh, you think less. Pardon me? Probably taking home less. And at 1%, they'll be taking home less than they. Right made last year. But the point is, it still does not allay the fact that the average increase for $2,500 is $1.20 an hour. So if you add 30 cents on top of that, that's $1.50 an hour in an actual raise. Because approximately one and a half percent would be 30 cents. <coughs> Brian, do you know what percentage you need to take home what you're currently taking home? Uh, roughly 2%. Be two. We can go. And it may depend on the individual employee and what they selected for. It, it'll get a little bit wonkier <coughs> to get it closer to 2, but 2 would be a little bit on the high side. It's like 1.9 for most employees. It's tough. It's a very tough decision to make. But there are compelling arguments out there. Yeah. And I'll probably vote against the majority of the board anyway. Might as well keep it up. We're on a roll. I don't. I don't think we should increase more than what we partially afford. Um, so that would be percent and a half. Five not even yeah. in that. Which is why I. You're complaining that you're going to get outvoted, but I asked you what you would say, and you didn't really give an answer. So, <laughs> he was wanting to vote against the answer, <laughs> right? I mean, geez, I've been stung too many times. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> um, for public works, there are quite a few communities around the state that are trying to hire for public works. You know, we don't have to be the highest paid, but. Well, it compensates uh, health insurance at 100%. They do the entire thing. Okay. They also don't have any employees, do they? Well, could. They yeah. also have a hard time attracting employees. I think it could be some workplace culture issues, too. But... Well, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I really am. You kind of threw us under the bus last meeting we had when you brought that up. Threw no one under the bus. And, and, uh, That's a good point. But uh, the thing is, there are probably other issues that have to do with that Absolutely. up there. It's not necessarily a dollar and cents issue in Booker. It's part of it. So, uh, so under one point nine something, they're not even. And at one and a half, we are uh, um, staying within our budget. I mean, again, you're complaining that I'm throwing you under the bus. I've asked you your opinion twice, and you haven't <laughs> given one. Well, so. you're looking for my opinion. My, my opinion is that we're, we're paying too much. Um, you know, it's like, you know, I can go on and on and on. I mean, that uh, um, I spent 34 years of my life in service to our country. Uh, for the carrot on the stick, uh, which was a health care coverage for my family. Uh, and at one time, I received uh, prescription medication for free. And now I'm, I'm getting increases in co-pays and everything else and uh, increases in insurance, uh, increases through Delta, Delta Dental through 
uh, the state of Vermont, which I retired from through the municipality, uh, my costs continue to go up, but I don't get compensated. So I maintain parity, you see? And so there are a lot of other people in the community that are the same way. Uh, they don't have the luxury uh, of uh, somebody making up the difference for them so that they maintain parity. Uh, and so I guess that's the answer to my, your question. We're paying too much. You suggest a percentage? I'm not gonna suggest any percentage. I'm gonna ask a question. I mean, dealing with compensations is a huge issue. That's on item four of 12 that are left. Um, some of these others are code of conduct, warning for sale of trailer, it shouldn't be too long, uh, adoption of dilapidated building ordinance, merger study update, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and it's 20 to 11. Does the board want to recess at some point and come back? Yep. We can accomplish a few more things. So are you telling me you're going to recess the compensation? No, maybe finish the compensation and then we'll be at midnight. It's not going to be midnight to finish the compensation. I haven't heard any numbers thrown out yet. Well, there'll be some in a few minutes, I'm sure. He keeps asking for your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> My opinion isn't worth a whole lot, except when you want to give me to, to, to make a decision. For it. Then, then that's when it's worth but a lot. Uh, and I'm not going to make your decision for you. Anybody got a number? So what's our ability to retain our people if we do not, uh, if, if they see their wages going down to take home? Well, I have a CDL, I can drive truck. I know a lot of other people that are retired with CDLs and they drive truck too. But we have office employees as well as- Can you type? Slowly, but I can tell you. <clears throat> I'm not going to shave my legs if you're going to ask me that. The, this, the, what you went out with for uh, GN's replacement, um, you must have a number in your head that you're going to offer for a salary. Oh, yeah, got that right. But it'd have to be a competitive salary. I don't know what you have for candidates yet, but if there are some good candidates, they're going to come in with certain qualifications. You're going to have to pay them a competitive rate. Are we competitive? So, would you expect any savings there? No. No. You're going to offer a new employee close to what you're paying? No. No. So why wouldn't there be saving? There's some of that. Okay. Not a... We're not talking that down the tower. Okay. Uh, so uh, to respond to Doug's theoretical question of who's going to leave and who's not, please remember that you have a tax base coming from the taxpayers who also have that ability to leave to go to another community, and we also have businesses that have not moved into our community yet. I can't say with 100% certainty, but I've heard tax rate. Um, so you have to look at both sides of the coin. Uh, as far as people who are working um, outside of Johnson and actually outside of Monroe County, just take a peek at 15. Look at the amount of people who are driving into Chittenden County for work. If there was a job opening in our town where they could live locally and make a pretty good, pretty decent salary and get great health benefits, 
I think you might have your workers ready to go. Totally. Agree. That's my opinion. It's not factual, it's just my opinion. I've never worked in the wild county. And I will put it all right. I won't. They, we don't, I don't make enough money to work in the wild county. I can't find a job in the wild county that would pay me enough to work here. Um, I agree with you. I think but you're here as a taxpayer. I'm here as a taxpayer, based but to Scott's point, Scott's point is we have good benefits package through our town. We pay competitively within this area. If somebody leaves, we will fill that position with somebody who is equally as skilled and talented as what we have. We should make decisions out of fear. We should make decisions which are the right decisions. And also, I would just add, people don't leave jobs because of money alone. People leave jobs because they're not happy with their job. I read articles all day long about culture and what keeps people motivated and happy in their job. It is almost never about money. So if people aren't happy and motivated in their job, it's not about what this percentage you're deciding on is. It's about the culture in which they work. What percentage of our taxes are tax are our tax based? Thank you. Based and what percentage comes from other taxes? That's a good comment, but thanks, Mike. It's <laughs> okay. wrong. Pretty hard to uh, bring out because it depends on the budget and what we got coming in. Sometimes it, we have a big influx of it does depend, rent. but we do keep track of <coughs> the amount to be raised by taxes. So last year, last year about two thirds of our money came in from taxes. Good night, folks. Good night. Last year was relatively high, but high from not from non-tax based. Uh, it was high. The amount raised by taxes was high last year, so we usually. We're usually a little bit better about uh, percentage, but last year, yeah, we took in about about two thirds of our income came from taxes. What about the uh, the tax equalization and the prebates and things like that? You know? Those don't rise as fast as a lot of our well, as our needs, really, and uh, so that ends up. Being that our uh, the amount that we have to raise from taxes increases faster. Most of the rebates are considered school rates. Pardon? Most of the rebates are considered school. Yeah, it's not on municipal. There is some, but not. You needed that, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Night laws. I didn't even see it there. Too. Actually, for the last few years, uh, the amount raised by non-tax sources has declined. So that means that even if the budget remained level, the amount we have to raise by taxes has been increasing. What, what percent of our budget is the salary? Is the new salary or our old salary? Uh, the old salary I can tell you relatively easily. Yeah, so. just the old salary. That's not Total. a good, that's not a good apples to apples comparison because depending on the year, if we have some project and there's a lot of influx of federal or state 
grant money. It can skew, make our budget look like it's quite a bit bigger and it's quite a bit of outside money coming in. But, but the question he had was for the compensation for all employees, I believe. Is that what portion comes out of the property tax? Well, it's, well, this, it's hard to figure. All we know is to raise $20,000, a little bit more than $20,000, it takes a penny on our grant. Well, I, I guess my point is that, uh, you know, we're, we're hearing about taxes, you know, yeah. and, and, and how hard they are. And you know, we're talking about these, you know, this is a segment of the money, you know, yeah. and uh, uh, NEMS is going to go up as much as, uh, as we're talking about here for the budget, you know, we're, we're beating everybody to death over a portion of this and other things are going up just as, just as much. Yeah, our other increases are gonna, for sources we can't control, are going up around uh, uh, 3%. I view, either of these choices as a race to the bottom. We don't pay our employees enough to retain them and we tax our people too much to uh, for them to stay here. Either way, it's like uh, move. <laughs> you know, try. Well, I'm sure there are lots of other people thinking the same thing though. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, therefore, the Jewett property, therefore the it's not necessarily that this town, it's the state of Vermont in general. Oh, it's the state of, if you drive across the country, it's the state of every, you know, you go through North Dakota, you go through Wisconsin, you go through Ontario, it's the state of, we are plus compared to many of the, you know, I drove like 3,600 miles through the central part of the country last year. And we are really flush compared to many places. These whistle stops don't exist anymore. They're dry and blown away. Doesn't mean it's easy here. Pardon? We're becoming a bookended country. So that's all good and well, but <laughs> so again, taking one year as a snapshot, last year as a snapshot, uh, salaries alone made up uh, seventeen percent of our budget. Well, that's a lot better than the sheriff's budget. Yeah, the yeah. sheriff's budget is a million dollars, and that was the vast majority. Yeah, they have budget. no overhead. It's all just employees. There is good news of the sheriff's budget, though. Yeah. Well. Well, it's three percent. Something like That's going to be for three years. All right, we got a good idea. Yeah. Um, I move that we increase pay one percent in the next budget. We have a motion on the floor of 1%. I've thrown out there 1%. Vote for it or not. Is there a second? Lacking a second. Motion to die. Motion right. dies. Well, I don't think this is getting anywhere. I need to get to bed. It's 11 o'clock. We talked about a hard stop at 10 30. We're beyond it. This is the conversation just the circular. If somebody has a, another number they want to throw out, but if nobody oh. wants to say anything, then I'll move one and a half percent. A motion for one and a half percent. That is it. And we have a second. Is there any discussion? God, I hope not. Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. And one the motion carries. Did you vote for it? I didn't vote either way. Okay, the chair votes. Yeah. So I, or, I do, I'm, uh, I hate to have been in the meeting, but I do think it's not. Did you vote, did you abstain or vote no? I abstained. Again, I make a suggestion that we recess the meeting. We have. Can I pick up one thing that is- Is there anything that has to be done tonight? Yes. What's that? Warning for the sale of the trailer. Yeah, that's the most important thing. We need to get rid of this, and uh, I've updated the date to reflect it. So, so move. Move to amend the date and sign the warning. Second. 
So okay. moved. Motion second. and a second. Is there any more discussion? All in favor signify saying aye. Aye. So this stage is the state is correct on this one. Yeah, um, but it's the it'll go for sale before our our second January meeting instead of our first January meeting. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to print off a new one? Have us sign it right now. This is the one I want you to sign right now. Okay. The dilapidated building ordinance wasn't that just the we had to clear up because it was incorrectly done. Yes. If you're willing to vote and sign that one, we can do that one right now too. I would move the dilapidated building ordinance. Last week, uh, last meeting, it was. The, it wasn't properly warned. It was, it was warned for discussion, but not for adoption. This time, it's warned for adoption. I move that we adopt it as it has been presented to us. Second. Motion and second. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Those opposed. I would see now, everything else on there is another signature item for you. Everything else on the agenda is something that can wait. Until, everything else can wait. Okay, let's bring it up at a future time. May I say one thing? You were going to say something on Duncan's we behalf about the phone call too, society. but we'll talk. Oh yes. Uh, yeah, about the Duncan and Dean would you like would. to come to oh, yeah. our one of our budget. Yeah, we'll I'm get sorry, to it. Duncan and Dean West would like to come to one of our budget meetings to discuss uh, some, basically uh, finishing out the, the uh, obligation from the historical society with the hist historic Holcomb House mm -hmm. and how much money they're going to be willing to, to forego for bring up. Uh, Duncan is only a member of the historical society town. Dean West is a member of the Historical Society Inc. and they're the ones that have the money. Um, and they're totally out of our control, but uh, they would like to be at our next budget meeting. So, or when we have a budget meeting. Cool. Other than that, uh, show us adjourned at almost 11 o'clock. Uh, 11.56 to be specific. <laughs> 10.56. Oh, 10.56. Thank you.